Good morning all, this is your host N Commander, and today we are going to be looking at Linux on a floppy disk. So for those who haven't caught the last stream, and I just realized my camera is aimed a little low, so let me fix that. Okay, well there's our hopefully our disk glitch for the uh, stream, and I did bring back the background music, hopefully it doesn't get content ID striked again, but I've definitely, I, I spent a lot of time on the last stream we did, I tested how well you can use free DAWs to install on uh, Windows 95, 98, and Millennium Edition. And that worked pretty well, but after finishing the stream, I spent a more time digging into it. And it ultimately comes down to that you can't fit a lot of drivers on a single disk, and because DAWs drivers have to be statically linked, they're it felt a little bit too limiting, so I spent the last week kind of... Let's see, hold on. Music is loud and I am quiet. Okay, hold on. Let's... Let's see here. Testing, one, two... Oh, I see what happened. Testing, testing... There we go. That... That should help. Uh, wrong mic. It should be listening to my main microphone. Yeah, it's listening to the the scar to the the interface. Okay. All right, and then I'll just lower the background music a bit. I should probably do it. All right, so yeah, I don't know why I feel like a gremlin comes in after every stream and messes with my audio settings, because. I think I can count on one hand the number of times I've started a stream and it just works. Um, so my current plan is I want, I'm currently going to be looking at Lila, but part of what I got this interest, uh, interest in is uh, when I was looking into this, um, Linus is actually looking at removing 486 support from the Linux kernel. Um, 486DX has been the baseline for the kernel since... I want to say 2005, it may be further back. So after that goes away, I'm assuming the new baseline would be Pentium. So, but as of writing, the current 6.1 kernel should, and I emphasize the word should here, run on a bona fide 486. Um, and I spent a fair bit of time digging through the source code of the Linux kernel, which I just realized I don't think I actually have checked out on the streaming account. But we'll deal with that in a moment. So the current plan, as it is, let me let me get a notepad up so I can walk you all through what I want to do. Um, actually, let me just bring up VS Code. Of course, okay, hold on. Why is code not showing up in my programs list? I feel like uh, okay. So apparently, the stream gremlins have heard that I am trying to do things. Let me... Alright, you know what? Let's go full screen. So the VS Code is running. But it is not showing up on the list of applications for screen capture. Uh, let me try automatic. Yeah, that did it. Okay. Of course it is completely missized. Let me fix that. Like I said, stream gremlins. Okay. So let's um, let's make a new document. So this is going to be our new file. That's our to do. So floppy Linux, or that's not how you do it. It's 
floppy Linux OS. So um, I want to see, so the first goal is, is it possible to start a 486DX with a modern Linux kernel from floppy? If so, can we also run some useful applications? My goal is sort of, I'm thinking part of what I want to do is I want to run links. Uh, because the idea of being able to do web browsing on a 486 kind of amuses me, and we should be able to get an SSL stack there. A minimum kernel with absolutely nothing in it is between 500 and 700 kilobytes. With compress, so that's about half of a floppy disk. But um, and just for context, I'm targeting high density, uh, high density 1.4 megabyte disks. It is possible to get a bit more out of that if I use DMF formatting, which brings it up to 1.7. But with compression, I'd like to think we could do a bit more than that. Um, I added a chroma key, or not chroma key, I, I added um, an effect to the background image. I just wanted to change it a little bit, but I always liked that image. It's one I took at dawn quite a bit ago. So. For the goals of the stream, uh, we need we need to compile a muscle C GCC targeting uh, MArch 486 and Tune 486, since that would be the lowest uh, that would be the lowest possible. I believe muscle C will in fact run on 486 if it requires the Exchange 8B. Uh, instruction which are compare and exchange B or comp X CNG 8B instruction then we're going to be limited to Pentium and up and uh, it would be a little depressing if I can't support 486s but I still want to see how far we can actually take a floppy disk uh, floppy disk Linux holy cow try saying that five times oh thank you for uh, thank you for the 100 uh, S-E-K, uh, that's Krona, Swedish Krona, I believe, uh, Super Chat. Um, it's starting at 3 a.m., well, 4 a.m. my time, because I'm awake at 4 a.m. for it this time. So I think where we need to start is we need to start with making the cross-compiler. Muscle C actually has an entire package for doing this, so I don't have to, like, roll my own like I have had to do in previous projects. So let's switch to that directory. Uh, and it has this config file. So let's make, let's see, let's open a terminal. And let me make this a little bigger just because it's a little hard to read as is. Yeah, that should work. Uh, bash, so copy, config, make to a new file. So we want to target 4A6 Linux muscle C, and then you can set a bunch of options relating to um, what the compiler will support. Let's see, your recommended options for deploying binaries. I believe what we need to do for GCC options is I need to set GCC config you know what, I'm actually not sure, so let me grab the GCC source code, because it has the options documented. Uh, GCC 10. Oh, of course. I will never know why these are not... Well, I do know why they're enabled by default, because it takes longer to download, and very few people actually need the source packages. So, there's that. Okay. Do all the updates. Let's see here. Um, well, by using a dedicated toolchain, it will... The biggest problem you get with building for 32-bit on 64-bit platforms is a lot of distributions don't really support it very well in GCC. My general opinion is that if you're going to do anything with embedded 
which is, I guess what this would count as, you always want to um, roll your own compiler. So if we go to GCC 10, I think it's, oh right, it's, I forgot, Ubuntu makes the, the GCC uh, tarball turducken. The expand. Right. Well, my thought is that we're going to have to compile Lilo and use Lilo as the bootloader to start the kernel. I did some digging through the kernel source code. Current versions of Linux, uh, somewhere between Linux 2.6 and Linux 4, the kernel lost support for swapping the root floppy for a RAM disk. But if we can just get enough of a user land, basically BusyBox, an SSL library, I could download what I need on the fly, or I could even just have it copied in from another desk. Wow, this is taking a bit. Oh, you know why it's taking so long to extract? It's because it's extracting, um, this is WSL, this is because uh, I'm running on Windows. It's extracting to the WSL file system. It's not building, uh, it's not going into the EXT uh, disk image that WSL uses. So that's a bit slower because the NTFS driver for Linux is, actually, I don't think they use the NTFS driver. I think they do it through networking these days, but I'd have to, I'd actually have to see what Microsoft's doing because I've never actually taken a particularly close uh, look. Yeah, oh, you know what that reminds me? People asked me on the last stream to move that. Uh, I'll put that over here directly above, well, me, I guess. Yes, I'm there. And that will go there. Uh, the main reason is that if I ever have to edit a stream in the YouTube editor, it causes the live chat to go away. So I would think I would um, burn it um, burn it in. Syslinux is also an option. I'm not sure which of the two I'm going to go with. Um, at this point, I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants. I've had a pretty miserable week, to say the least. Um, and the news has been depressing as well. For those who don't follow news in the United States, SCOTUS ruled, among other things, SCOTUS ruled this week both on ending affirmative action in the United States, which was, which essentially helped minorities, um, be able to get access to higher education to counteract racism and they've also gutted they, they essentially on first amendment grounds the the lawsuit was a wedding um someone who wants to start a website design business it basically said that they would not want to service anyone who falls under lgbt they hadn't actually started their business, and they did so in Colorado, which has a state, uh, uh, which had a state law specifically disallowing this sort of discrimination. Uh, it got heard through the courts. It got heard by SCOTUS, and SCOTUS upheld the plaintiff's defense, gutting discrimination and protection in the United States. And you know, it's like this time last year is when the Dobbs decision came down, and a lot of the leak decision was a lot of what decided for me to do political fundraising on this channel. This stream isn't a fundraiser. Um, I only can do fundraisers when I'm in an okay place and I haven't been because, again, I've been dealing with, you know, major life stuff. Uh, Joshua Wilso, thank you for the $10 super chat. And I used to live just outside of Portland, Oregon. I uh, lived out there for four almost five years i love the pacific northwest um it's especially what's so especially interesting is that in my middle school a bunch of people had a uh, fondness for the movie goonies um and the goonies is set in astoria oregon which is a place that you would only know about if you've actually seen that movie and it features the two major landmarks from Astoria, which is the Astoria Column, which is a light beacon for ships entering the Columbia River, and the Astoria, what is it, the Astoria Mangler Bridge that crosses the Columbia, 
it's one of the largest truss bridges in North America. It's not the largest. Uh, I think the longest one is still in Louisiana that connects New Orleans, which runs 24 miles over a lake. And there's also in Canada, the bridge between New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. That's 22 miles over open ocean. I've actually driven that one. Um, many, many years ago at this point, I actually drove from Oregon all the way out to St. John's. This is taking a really long time to extract. Um, so, yeah. The, uh, there's always a little bit of latency with YouTube, and I've been running... I, I no longer have been using the low latency options because it disables closed captioning on the live stream while I'm live, and so... I figured the chat delay was worth taking. I really should have extracted this to um, the WS file system, WSL file system, because I believe the option I need is with Arch 46, but I'm not completely sure about that. You know, I can Google this. Like, there's nothing stopping me from Googling this. Like us see here, GCC configure options. Let's see here, Let's see here, arch. Because that talks about uh, enable multi-arch, that's not what I'm looking, without multi-lib, it's also not what I'm looking for. Is it tuning or tune? Oh, here it is. With CPU is what I'm looking for. Uh, specify which compiler variant the code should, uh, the compiler should generate code for by default. So it needs to be with CPU 480, uh, I believe it's 486. Let me make sure that is the right option. With tune 486. Like, I don't see i486 is the actual option okay so if we go back here we do plus with cpu i486 with tune i486 and that should generate a version of gcc that basically just generates code for the 486 all right, uh, let's control C that because we're going to basically die of old age. Uh, if it's really going to be that slow building on the Windows side, let me move these over to the Linux side and then I'll remount. The, the directory is already mounted as Z, so all I gotta do is move where the code is. Like, uh, oh, right, because the. All right, so let's see here. So open folder this computer. All right, it's a network drive. Uh, come on. Or is it not? I'm clicking network and I'm getting a spinning cursor. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm running Windows because I kept having so many problems with trying to use DaVinci Resolve on Linux that I basically gave up out frustrating. Okay, I can't seem to mount. Let's see here. Hold on. Oh, here we go. Map to network drive. There we go. That's what I needed. Now that I have that mapped as network drive. Yep, there we go. Z. I have my Z drip folder source there we go cool and yeah i trust the authors of this folder so let's make a new terminal and i'll make this nice and big so we can see what's going on so i should at this point just be able to type make as long as i'm in the right folder And yeah, that's going to start downloading, so. 
All right, so this will give us our muscle C cross compiler targeting for a six. Are you kidding me? Why did that fail? Oh, did the line endings get mangled? You know, I bet that's exactly what happened. Chat, this is off to a great start. All right, let me grab that folder. Let me, let's grab this fresh from Git because obviously, uh, obviously, technology just does not like me today. All right, let's try that again. Uh, okay. All right, let's grab that Git clone, and uh, yeah, you know what? we can grab the make file tools. So now we can switch into the crossmake folder. Copy config make config.make. Refresh. Alright, so let's set the target. Uh, where do I want to install this? I'm going to put this in my home folder for now, so home, uh, I don't, wait, does my home folder have a capital in it? No, it does not. N commander 46 muscle, uh, C, tool chain 46 muscle C, and now let's go down to GCC options, GCC config with CPU I-46, with tune I-46. Okay. And make sure, let's make sure the chat looks good. That does. All right, so let's try doing a make and see if it's less unhappy. Well, it's building, so that's progress. All right. So that'll give us the start of our, um, I, it probably was just a side effect of checking out a file with Git for Windows, and I, I probably, I have it fixed on the, and the normal, my main user account. I always stream on a secondary user account because I've always, you know, I, I always worry that I'm accidentally going to bring up Discord or another chat app and accidentally leak a message. So I always make sure to stream on a fresh account where I don't have, where I'm not logged into Discord, and so forth. So okay, so it is building this. So this is a good sign. Uh, can I move my? Yeah, I can move the chat a little bit to the left. I'm still getting used to using Streamlabs. It's got a lot of really nice features. Oh, someone tipped me. Uh, still comedy. Thank you for the twenty-one dollar and eighty-three cents tip. So, um, the goal is if we can successfully get this to work, I still want to actually put it on floppy disks and put it in what will be the Restless Systems LLC store. Um, I actually sent some messages to, um, uh, I get tax assistance through the, through LegalZoom, and so... I'm currently dealing, figuring out the logistics of what it takes to sell an actual product because I have to collect sales tax. Uh, that means I have to file for a permit with the New Jersey Division of Taxation. And I may have to do that in other places as well and then keep very careful track of what I sell and what it goes to. Uh, the, I, I, if, assuming we are successful, I do want to do a video talking about this and I am recording the stream uh, to use as source footage, so I'll probably talk about that then as well, since I should have it hopefully figured out by then. So actually, wow, 81 viewers considering it's 423 in the morning. Yeah, um, you know, I, you know, speaking of CentOS, I saw, I, I, I'm a little late to this party, I just recently got caught up with 
Red Hat basically killing all their downstreams, and it's like depressing. You know, and I've been dealing with my own stuff off stream. I've been working to try and rebuild and resurrect. I shouldn't say resurrect, but help improve a community that I did long before I did YouTube. Um, I've talked about this a bit on Patreon. It's getting there, but it's very slow going. And I don't know. I. I don't know. I've been struggling with my own life stuff pretty badly. It's not been great. You know, it's even hard to talk about on stream because a lot of people come here, watch, and come for a good time. And I'm always the type of person that tries to make sure that everything is entertaining and good. But, you know, when I'm not in a very good place, it's hard. And... I've sort of been trying to debate if I want to intermix in some non-tech content. Mostly because on the really bad days, it's difficult. For those who don't know, I... Well, it's... It, health issues suck is really what it gets down to, and I find myself having trouble talking about it, even though I know I've talked about it multiple times on stream in the past. So... Um, yeah. Originally, it was that I would basically only have to collect taxes in my home state, which in this case would have been New Jersey, but, um, a few years ago, there was a court case, Wayfinder v. someone. Shopify handles most of figuring out who I have to send sales tax to at the end of each quarter, but I still have to get the actual permit to collect sales tax. So, it's interesting, to say the least. But, I have been debating on potentially... A lot of what it comes down to is that while I really do enjoy doing these types of streams, I also... A lot of times, I have been lacking inspiration. Like, it's I've had multiple projects that I've tried to get started. Like I did a lot of work on looking into OS two, and then I did a bunch of the stuff with PowerPC. And each time I've sat to try and get a video down, it's like inspiration just escapes me. It was I attended the stream yesterday, and the weight of everything just kind of was crushing. You know. Like, I, 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 no matter, you know, I, I always am trying to do the best content I can, and I know for a lot of the things that I do, it is unique on YouTube. There's a million and one people who do gaming streams. There's even a lot of people that do retro tech, like, uh, realistically, LGR and Apic Guy were the two big channels that kind of paved it to the point that vintage tech YouTubes are as popular as they are on YouTube. But it's hard for me at times. No, and, you know, that is part of it. Like, you know, and there's there's other aspects to this, like... Uh, I'm trying to figure out what, it's, what, what I'm trying to say here. Sorry if I'm just kind of rambling. It was... I'm going to do this stream because I, I made a promise to myself at the beginning of this year that if I wasn't going to do videos... I would try and stream at least once a week. Now, I haven't been completely on top of that. Um, and part of that is also due to kind of the isolation. I have a sleep disorder. I, that I've talked about plenty of times stream, uh, on air, and it's part of why I'm streaming at 4 a.m. in the morning. It's why it's hard for me to hold regular work. And 
and being able to talk with chat helps with that. It helps a lot, actually. So that's why I've been kind of debating adding some non-tech content. Like, I've done NetHack streams before, but considering NetHack is from 1987 and is about as vintage of a game as you can get. You know, it's like, I've had an urge to, like, play Factorio. Uh, I've been playing... I actually started a space exploration run back in May, and I have a, a little alarming number of hours, although a lot of it's been AFK, and I am thinking that while... I, what I would want to do is I'd want to keep the weekend streams dedicated to doing tech projects perhaps add some during the week where I do a game or something. Well, the software part is... Mm, it's what I've been good at because a good chunk of my life, um, like, from when I was a kid, I... From what my parents told me, I, I never slept well as a kid. From what I personally remember is being awake at 3 a.m. just on the family computer because there was nothing else to do. I couldn't sleep. Like, we tried everything. Uh, you know, and maybe it was one thing if it was good at one point, but it never was. And as I got older, the sleep issues got worse and worse. It was a fairly large contributing factor of why I struggled the whole regular work. It's actually been nice here. It was drizzling when I went downstairs a little earlier, so the heat has been dying down. Um, the, bi the other big problem I'm worried about is I don't have a good air conditioner in the living room. I have a portable unit right here to my right, which is directly aimed at me, but it's not powerful enough to cool the living room. Like, I have the sheet over there blocking off the hallway to try and keep the cold air in here but this room gets unbearable so I've been debating if I want to try streaming more off the laptop maybe I, I have run streams off I have a MacBook Pro I actually bought it um, to do video stream to do video editing while traveling I used it to edit a bunch of restless system videos and I've used it to check and edit a few other things, so that's how, yeah, oh yeah, I, I did read that YouTube is blocking ad blockers, uh, I didn't do a make dash J because this is the muscle C one, I probably should do a make dash J, but also I, I don't know, I've had enough of, Dash J can cause Ooga Booga build failures, and it also gives me a time to just kind of talk, which is nice. So. I don't know. Like, I don't know what, you know, the, the biggest concern I've had about not doing doing a few non-tech streams on YouTube is the algorithm does kind of punish you for it. For those who don't know, the YouTube algorithm, basically when I do a stream, the it doesn't notify everyone that is subscribed that I'm streaming. Um, I've, I've heard reports that if you've actually checked the bell, it's still not reliable, and the analytics shows how many stream notifications go out. So if you have a lower click-through rate, which is what happens when you stream something that is, shall we say, out of your wheelhouse, the algorithm will promote it less and less, and then that has a knock-on effect further down. Like, quite a few streamers have uh, talked about that before. Yeah, it's YouTube being YouTube, but, you know, I also know that, like, I put the stream up, and 91 people show up. And that's obscene. Uh, that, that's, that, that blows my mind. I, I was, you know... Statistically, and I've heard this for Twitch, I don't know what the numbers are for YouTube. And I have a decent idea of what the numbers were like with Mixer. But, like, on Twitch, one only the top 1% of streamers get an average of 10 viewers. 
Beyond that, it all kind of groups together into the very large dreamers. Like, um, I can't even think of any names off the top of my head, but that's basically what the breakdown is. It's like, I think it's like 1% like have an average of 10 and 0.1% have an average of 100. My numbers fluctuate a fair bit. They have been going down probably just because I haven't done the video in so long. Uh, the last video I did was the POSIX real-time one. Alright, enough people are telling me that I should do a dash J that I will do a dash J. Alright, I'll do... I'll do dash it J4 just so it doesn't accidentally lag out uh, stream beat, uh, Streamlabs. It's something that I've run into when I used to do Ubuntu development. Uh, it was... What it tends to happen... Like, with GCC, it's probably fine, because GCC is probably one of the most developed pieces of software on the planet. I Someone did, like, an estimate a few years ago of how many uh, man-hours have gone into developing GCC. But the problem with using Dash J is a lot of times people don't test the concurrency and you end up with race conditions. So most, at least with Ubuntu, the default is usually not to build with dash J since it gets offloaded to the build Ds. And realistically speaking, the end user doesn't have to deal with multi-hour builds. I'm doing this live and suffering through it. So there's that. Yeah, so, yeah, I think for this it would be safe. It's more other packages where there would be problems. Um, no, you can shoot yourself in... The way you blow your... The way it causes problems is if you don't have the dependencies properly defined in the makefile or for auto tools in makefile.am, because a lot of projects list the dependencies but don't actually wait for the output of the command to finish because make will just immediately go on to the next target. Um, so it basically goes kafrui. But I am like curious if it basically my thought process right now is if we can get busybox wolf SSL and links onto a floppy disk with a handful of drivers you could download everything else you need and load it into a RAM desk. Now, I'm not going to say that is a particularly useful thing because most 486s are going to top out at 8 megabytes of memory. I'm ignoring mine, but, um, yeah. I... <sighs> Switching from Ubuntu back to Windows was a very bitter pill for me. Like, I I'm still an Ubuntu core developer, and... I've worked with free and open source software for the vast majority of my life. I... I mean, a lot of it for me started with seeing... The earliest I can remember is watching the discussions relating to the DMCA and such when it was first introduced on Slashdot. And essentially watching how copyright just gets longer and longer and longer. And as a side effect, basically, a large chunk of everything is being forgotten and lost. I mean, the Internet Archive only exists because they received an exemption from the U.S. Uh, US Library of Congress to do what they did, uh, which was essentially back up the Internet. But how much, how many, oper you know, how much of vintage computing has just disappeared into the aether? And there's people that argue that, you know, you need to move on with the times, but I find it difficult to see that, see all of it just kind of disappear. You know, I know that there are people out there that have intentionally destroyed source code so it couldn't be released to the community. That was, it's come up a few times when discussing this on Discord. I 
I mean, um, Chris Strickland, it is possible. Um, many, many, many years ago, I was active. I was an active developer uh, on XDA Developers, which is kind of the home of phone hacking. At the it, at the time, it was mostly Windows Mobile because Android was just coming out. But I reverse engineered the camera on the T-Mobile G1 or the HTC Dream. So it became possible to run Android 2.0 on it when that device, its last official update was for Android 1.6. It's not trivial and I've gotten the impression that doing this is a lot harder than it used to be. And wow, that is actually done building already. So let's do a make install. So now that we've done a make install, we go to toolchain. So we should let's make sure it actually got our, yeah, here it is. With CPU i4a6 with tune i4a6. So let's add this directory to our path. Alright, there's that. So let me get a fresh check out of my floppy disk repo because I need this to be rebuildable. So we're basically going to work out a make file for this. So let's let's start getting to work because now that we've got a tool chain. Let's start uh, let's start working from there. Uh, Oh, you know, it helps if I check it out to the right folder. Uh, la, la, la. Yeah, no, it actually does help if you check it out to the right folder. Why do I have... I, I have the spinning cursor of doom for whatever reason. Wow, I think my system really hates me tonight. Probably because I haven't rebooted it in a while. Oh, come on. It's probably trying to figure out what happened to the folder I just moved, and yeah, you, you can see the cursor is just spinning there. Can you add some background to the text box so it can be easily read? Uh, which text box? Is that the... Um, is that the uh, the chat one? The uh, okay. So all right. So I guess the first thing we want to do is fetch kernel like. So let's start by making a make file. So let's make a stamp directory so it doesn't always try and do this from scratch. Uh, and what we can do is we can grab the Linux kernel. I should probably like check signatures, but you know this is basically going to be a one-off. Well, I shouldn't say it's a one-off. So uh, let me grab stamp fetch kernel. CD, uh, so make DIR, because if I do distribute this, I have to comply with the terms of the GPL. It means all these source files I have to make sure I make available. So let's do that and then set a variable Linux kernel URL, like that, and then. Uh, Linux kernel URL like that. And then let me add that to the build rule. So if we do that, new terminal, and I type make, uh, correction, I type bash to switch to, yeah, okay, cool. That starts downloading the kernel.
Excellent. Um, so fetch kernel. And then we probably want to... Okay, and this we don't want to print a message. Alright, step fetch kernel. Yeah, you know, I guess that works. Um, fetch kernel. And then we will add make dir source cd source tar extract all dist linux uh, it's probably better if I code the version string in here but yeah hold on let's see here That way, if I want to switch the name of the kernel, it's not that hard. So if I want to do a make clean source, source disk, Stamp. Uh, we are actually we do need to make the stamp directory because the stamp directory is how we tell that we've already done this step, so it won't try and do it over and over again. Yeah, see what I did there is it started downloading a new, the same file. So make clean, make, and then that just downloads it. I probably should split that into a separate step where it just downloads the everything. Yeah, actually, that's probably the smart thing to do here. Wow, 115 viewers. Okay. So let's add a stamp fetch. I'm still trying to figure out the best way to structure this. I'm a little, my make file is a little rusty. Yeah, if we do a refresh, yeah, cool. And then it sees all that, and that's good. And then why did it, oh right, you need dash P so you don't try and do that twice. Or not that you don't do it twice, but you don't error out trying to do it. So, this gives us the fetch kernel. Uh, yes, we want to configure kernel. Well, let, let's before we do configure kernel. Alright, that will let me do Linux DIR. Uh, kernel menu config. Alright, let's let's add a new directory here. Config. And let's make a minimal Linux config. So make arch uh, x86 tiny config. So this will make the absolute smallest. Okay, I need some utilities here. This, can I do build dev Linux image? Five one five. Yeah, like it shouldn't matter. Like any of these will work. Of course not. Why would it be that easy? I 
Okay, apparently Ubuntu is cha- Alright, you know what? I'm just gonna install Flex Advice on my hand. Like, why am I doing this the hard way? Flex, Bison. I don't remember what else needs to be there. Uh, can we run tiny config now? Okay, we can run tiny config. So that's going to basically grab that. So now what we want to do is configs.config. Config kernel dot config. And then we can there we go. Alright, so there's our minimal Linux config, although it's not completely correct because that uh that was the wrong tool chain, but uh we will fix that in a moment. So for kernel menu config, what we want to do is let's see here. We want to make sure we can fetch the kernel, so that's that. Uh, we want to copy configs, or er, sorry, config, delete, config, kernel config to source Linux. Dir dot config make arch x eighty six cc equal. Uh, I'm going to define this cc equal. Actually, I do. I want to do cc. No, I think I want cross compile. Cross compile equal i four a six muscle. I four A six Linux muscles be like that. Um alright, so and then after it does that, I want it to copy this back to the kernel config directory like that. So that way if I do kernel menu config. Oh right, I have to be in the I have to actually be in the right directory for that. Uh, okay. Alright, so C compiler not found. Okay, so that means I just need to add Didn't I already add it to the path? I feel like I already did this. Uh, maybe I just did it wrong. Uh, well, that didn't work. Hey, okay, so that time it just complained that the screen is a little bit too small. And that is the, uh, that is us being able to start being able to make a custom Linux kernel. All right, I'm, give me a moment. I'm just going to step away from keyboard for a second. I'll be right back.
and I'm back. Uh, all right. And Anonymous, thank you for the $10 tip. All right, let's see here. Uh, Make.c, left cross compile. No, cross compile needs to be, all right, uh, before we do more here, hold on. Let's make sure it actually copies it. Yeah, see, it did copy it back. And if we take a look, yep, there it is. CCC version text is correct. So let's let's get this in git. So let's create a git ignore file because uh, we're going to need to keep track of a lot of this. Git ignore. Uh, ignore the dist folder. Ignore the source folder. Ignore the stamp folder. Git status. I've seen many config. I, I even remember using xconfig. I don't know if it's xconfig is still supported. I haven't used that in a very long time. All right, so there is a guide, um, and I'll link it. It's a post on Medium, so I'll link it in chat. I'll drop it in chat. That talks a bit about basically building the most the minimalist kernel possible so let's let's start doing let's do everything we need to actually build that kernel so kernel menu config will handle that but let's handle a uh, let's add a build kernel step so this depends on fetching the kernel we need to cd into the Linux directory, and then we just need to run it like so. And uh, we also need to copy in the config as such. So, in theory, if I just do make build kernel right now, does that actually build something? Uh, well, it needs BC. Actually, uh, you know what? Chat just mentioned, pointed out that I should be using make like that. And you know what? I feel like, yeah, you know what? It's not brackets. I should be using. I feel like one of these is variable, one is macro, and make syntax is making my brain hurt, but I have, I will say that, like, I have a love-hate relationship with make files, like, a well-built make file is wonderful for a maintainer, but you are dealing with something that was built for generations of computing long, long ago. Okay, that is building. Uh, let me make J that. Actually, I didn't pass the J option down. Uh, I guess I just need to add it by hand. I'll just put a J4. Well, like I said, I'm curious on how small it is. From what I read in the Medium article, like, it already says Arch XA6 boot BZ image is ready. How big is that file, though? Arch. Uh, let's see here. So, source Arch. Source Linux Arch x86 boot bz image 495 kilobytes that's compressed if it's not compressed uh do we have hold on should be in the top level yeah vmz linux 1.5 megabytes so one that's what the resident kernel that's what it will use in memory when it's all said and done but this kernel has nothing useful in it 
So let's add some little bits and bobs just to try and make it slightly more more useful. And then let's also add a rule. Make directory make directory out cp source linux directory all right what's the direct what's the path i need bz linux like that to out bz image so that would put it over there let me run that commit. Oh, I also probably probably need to put a Actually, I don't need to put any special rules because the kernel, it, it won't rebuild the kernel. The kernel's make file will handle rebuilding it if it's needed. Yeah, because it should do a sync and then immediately decide that yeah, there's no place no need to copy that or uh, no need to rebuild it, I should say. Okay, there we go. So now let's do uh, kernel menu. Okay, let's enable. Let's enable some things to actually make this a bit more useful. So the tiny Linux toolbar uh, thing from Medium, which is what I'm kind of using as my initial reference. Uh, we need to enable TTYs. So config TTY would be device drivers. Like you can see that there are absolutely no drivers here. Let's see here. I believe it was under character device. Yeah, here it is, character devices. So let's enable uh, TTYs. Do we need, are we, is there anything here? Yeah, we have keyboard, mouse support, which is all we really care about. Uh, I don't think we need file system. I might want to enable module loading, but we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so use syslib protocol, kernel.c support. We do want RAM, uh, RAM disk support. Um... LZMA would be the best compression or one of the better ones, but I'm also worried about dealing with the size of the archive or the size of excess code. So embedded system is fine. What else do we need? We probably should get uh, kernel print K support. And that is under print K general setup I wish that it could just bring you right to it uh, standard features Why am I not seeing this? Compile drivers that shall not load, kernel compression mode, preemptive, relay FS, okay, boot config support. Am I just blind? Configure standard kernel features. I've never really done a lot with core boot. I'm sorry if I'm not really paying attention to the chat right now. It's somehow, oh, here it is. Standard kernel, standard kernel features. Uh, so what do we need here? We, 
multiple users Pro I don't probably don't actually need that, but we do want support for print K so we can get boot messages. So what does that bring our kernel up to? Because that's gonna make it quite a bit larger. Someone, was there, no, okay. I just saw something move on the other screen. I thought someone tipped or super chatted. So there's that. Uh, Z image is just means it's a gzip compressed image. The kernel has never fat, uh, fit in conventional memory. Uh, Loadlin, Loadlin will just load it right into XMS space. You can't, uh, you can't fit a kernel in well, I guess you could fit a kernel in conventional memory, but I actually don't remember offhand. I don't think the kernel uses conventional memory. There's issues with reclaiming that little bit of memory space. And, all right, so out, vzip image. So that didn't get much bigger. So in theory, in theory we should be able to actually boot that. So... What we can do, and let me go desktop view here so you can see what I'm doing. Um, I installed uh, QM. Oh, this might be an interesting problem. Can this. Can I access the Z drive here? I can access the Z drive. Okay. N Commander, source, floppy Linux, out. Hume system i386 mem32 kernel bz image. Oh, and it popped into the background. And nothing's happening. Okay. For a first test, that works great. It didn't completely crash. All right, what did I do wrong? Or is there more options I have to set? Let's see here. Enable TTY, print K, and memory. So I get no output. I maybe, uh, oh, you know what? Maybe I need VGA support. Maybe I have to compile in VGA support. Uh, frame buffer. Yeah, we probably don't have any frame buffer driver installed, do we? Device drivers. Let me let me just catch up with chat. It's possible it's running, but uh Kernel runs in protected memory. Uh, well, yeah, I would need L support, but I should still get Linux boot messages with what I just have. Like something feels like it's missing. Preemptive behavior, control group, boot config, device drivers. Graphic support, here we go. Well, that's not what I need, I don't want, need DRM. We're not gonna be trying to run X on this. 
I thought I enabled the TTY. Did I not do that? No, apparently I didn't. Okay, that would well, explain it. Uh, TTY. Where was that option? Config, TTY, character devices, enable TTY. I could have. I, I thought I did that. Okay, so it copied that to there. Let me make sure it actually worked. Alright, well, that's there. Build kernel. <sighs> and then let's see if it will actually start now. Let me just try CPU 486 just to... <sighs> yeah, it says 486 is supported, could not open... Oh, because I got the options. Okay, well, that's new. Uh, for those who can't see it, it says this kernel requires an i686 um, i686 CPU. That's interesting. Why is it? Let me first add a new, let me make a new scene just so we can make this window full size. That was not what I wanted to do. I want to duplicate this scene. And it is now doing the thing where it blacks out my entire... I really feel like technology just does not like me today. There we go. Yeah, so that's what that's doing. Kernel requires an i386 uh, processor family. Okay. Uh, chart reuse. I I'm, am trying to make sure I get names right. It's difficult for me. Of course. Of course that broke. So let's do another round of kernel menu config. Which config? Uh, M. Okay, so I need M forty six. M forty six. Processor type and family choice. Okay, so that would be on the top level. Processor family. Uh, I don't think an SX would work. I think DX is the minimum. Alright. Build. Well, I will try it on actual hardware. I want. I will try it in 86 box, and then once I have it reasonably complete, I will try it on the actual machine, an actual 486. Uh, currently, the minimum is still 486DX. Linus is talking about removing it in the semi-near future, but it hasn't happened as of yet. 
as far as I am aware. So let's see if that did it. Okay, so my scene... Oh, I see what happened. Hold on. Delete that window capture. Add a new window capture. Uh, window capture. I don't want media file. I want general sources. So here it is. Window capture. Add a new source. And that did start. Yeah, okay, so that did exact, so it, um, yeah, it failed to mount a, find an int and died, but it did boot. Let's uh, restart just so we can watch it from the beginning. Yep, there it goes. So it does try and start, um, which is actually really good progress. So now we need to actually put a RAM disk on it. Uh, I also need to put a bootloader on it so we can hopefully theoretically build something that works? Question mark? Alright. So, well, there's not going to be uh, like an actual um, file, uh, you know, a file system. So, because we're going to try and do this with a RAM disk. At least as far as we can get it. So, that tells me the next thing to try and build is BusyBox because BusyBox would give us a start of a RAM disk image. So let me let me find the source code to the most recent BusyBox. BusyBox. Okay. Done. GitHub, no, it's not on GitHub. I just need to find the original. Because that's a mirror. Uh, where is BusyBox's upstream? BusyBox.net. Okay, so here's the download. So, BusyBox URL. BusyBox tarball. Let's add a new fetch busy box. I, you know I gotta fix these. Let's add stamp to this rule. Fetch busy box. Or stamp fetch busy box. Okay, so that fails to download. Probably because I put the wrong URL. Uh, yeah. That's exactly what I did. Okay, so that extracts BusyBox. Uh, we now need to do, we need a BusyBox menu config. Uh, BusyBox dir equals BusyBox. One three six one and like this is a little ugly, but it works. All right, so busy box, 
busybox dir, busybox dir, busybox config. Make busybox menu config. So I'm not sure what the smallest, like let's just see what we can get with like a default one and see what it comes down to. Because we can definitely remove more parts of this as we need it. So now let's add a rule for making, uh, for building BusyBox. So in the out directory, let's not do that just yet. Busybox config to busybox dir. That. All right. Uh, build busybox. Again, uh, you know, I should stamp these just so it. So it doesn't always try and do that. Uh, actually, no, I don't want to do that because, again, I want to let the upstream build system handle that. So busy box. Uh, okay, so make build busy box. So what is this? I'm curious on what this is going to come out to in terms of build size. So if we take a look at out busy box, oh, uh, this will be in source busy box. What does it come out to busy box? 915 kilobytes. Okay, we need to fit with that. We need to fin down a little bit because that that's not gonna fly. Make busy box menu config. Although it will get compressed, so um, there's that. But I think we can get that quite a bit smaller. Uh. Like, none of this we need. Loading module code would probably be good. Yeah, I think we can just turn all of this off. Like pivot root, I might, some of these I might need, but I'll re-enable them as I need them. Networking utilities. These I probably want. I actually didn't know BusyDocs had a built in FTPD or HTTPD. I feel like we could have fun with that, but again, let's, um, let's get rid of what we don't actually need. Uh, IF config, IF up, down. Oh, I need to look at chat. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, chat. <laughs> That's a fail. That's an F on my part. Some of these, um, let's see here. What else can, like, how much is this we do or don't need? Like, that's quite a few utilities. 
you can definitely squeeze in there. Like we don't need TFTP support. Trace route we don't need. Tunnel control. WGET I would like because it might let us do some other things. UDHCP we would want. Because ultimately speaking, if we can get online, we could download everything else we need and pivot route. Right, <clears throat> we don't need boot chart D. We do need int, reboot, power off. Uh, I don't think we need Linux RC. Don't need find, don't need grab. Don't think we need any of this. I'll leave Vi just in case it proves to be useful. Because text editors sometimes are for debugging. None of that helps. Console utilities. Nope, that all goes away. Core utilities. Aphrodite, thank you for the $7 Canadian uh, super chat. Uh, free me for... I don't know how to free you from the chat box, unfortunately. All right, so that's a decent amount. Having RPM, Static libgcc. None of those we need. None of those we need. Definitely don't need printer support. Don't need any email support. Process support. Most of these we probably don't need, so I am just going to get rid of. All right, let's see how much that gets it down to size. So let's make busy box. Like how much? How much smaller does that get? Because that dumps a very large chunk of it. And obviously we haven't compressed this and put this in a RAM disk yet. Alright, so if we take a look at source busy box busy box. Well it's down to five hundred and seventy five kilobytes. Now just out of curiosity, if we were to compress this, what does this come down to? Like, does it get smaller? It does get smaller, but not by a lot. Uh, so what can we do to make that a little, like, what a, is there more that we can get rid of? Yeah, there's more we can get rid of. We don't need RPM, we don't need tar. Well, we do, tar might be useful, so I'm gonna hold on to that one. Uh, unzip. I'm just looking to see which commands like as far as low hanging fruit goes, like, because a good chunk of these, Q 
can all go away. Like, we don't need those. Uh, TTY, we probably... Like, there is a limit of how much you can remove before everything starts going snap. But I'd be kind of inclined to just download more. All right, uh, change route. I'm going to disable the dash V messages because that should get more disk space back. What else we can get rid of? Uh, you know what? I actually will get rid of Vi. All this we can get rid of because if we're going to do that, we can do it with downloading it on the fly. We don't need boot chart. Did my config get clobbered? Because I feel like I disabled these. Hold on. Am I doing the same work twice because I screwed up? Yes, no, I did actually screw that up. Okay. Um, because it copied in the kernel config. Alright, let's see here. Let's try that again. Make sure when I save it, it goes back. Yeah, okay, it does go back. Okay. Uh, I probably need to fix all this, but so be it. I will leave tar enabled. D pack we can get rid of. Uh, CPIO we can get rid of. utilities. Let me... Well, clear is useful. Everything else. Uh, reset, I'll leave. Set console. don't need shadow passwords like we don't need user support we don't support users I will leave the kernel module stuff there just because maybe we can use it uh, D message I'll actually leave because D message is useful uh, we don't need F disk I'll leave more. That's actually useful. We want mount. Which means we also want unmount. Uh, yeah, alright, let's try that. How much of this can we make just all go away? Let's see here. Oh boy. Well, yeah, we probably will need that, but like I said, I want to know what the absolute baseline is. Uh, I will leave IF config. 
Yeah, we'll leave I have config just in case we need it. We don't need inet. Telnet and Telnet D is kind of interesting because you could Telnet into it and have it be a multi-user system, although we'd have to enable that. Trace route we don't need. Uh, Wget we do want. Uh, we don't need UDHCPD, that's the daemon. This one, yeah, that's the client. So the client we want. The rest goes away. Most of these I think we can get rid of. Uh, PS we should leave. Uh, as well as system control. Top is nice, although it's a bit big. All this goes away. What's hush? Uh, we don't need hush. Math support. So how much smaller does this get? So 431 kilobytes, which when combined with our kernel, that fits on a floppy disk and it still has some room left over. Uh, not a lot, but it does have room left over. I don't know if it is or is not um, I don't know what is or isn't what we do or don't need but like I said we're kind of going for a minimum build here so what we want to add to the make file is um, let me make sure this actually is going to work the way I think it's going to work before I say that so source busy box make desdir temp test install and it's going to rebuild the system tool chain but that's fine I, I'm not that worried about it I just want to know if it's going to do the sign links if on the make install because if I have to do that by hand it's going to be annoying yeah okay so it will actually do um, it will do the links okay so if we want to do that um, we want to now do make busy box we need to add a make install line with a desk dir flag because that will tell you, that will make the root directory. Uh, probably should have. Uh, I probably shouldn't do this as a relative path. I need to do this as um, int ramifs base equal. that all right int ramfs base test dir helps when you spell it right 
Wow, 166 viewers. Okay, I'm impressed. Alright, so make... Make, build, busy box. So it compiles all that. Now if we look in the out directory. Oh, hold on, I gotta add a make install. Uh, BusyBox takes advantage of argv0, which is the name of the binary and how it was called, and that's how it gets dispatched. So if we take a look now, where did that end up? Oh, that, that didn't quite work the way I thought it was going to work. <laughs> um, instead of ending up in the current directory, uh, I got a, it, I know where it ended up. It ended up here in source busy box. And I bet there's now an out folder here. Or did it do it in my top level folder? Like where did where did it actually put that? Hold on, find name busy box. Uh, it should have installed somewhere? Question mark. Uh, hold on. Make get CMW. Relative path. Let's see here. Okay, so apparently I can do it like this. Root directory. That, where did it dump at that time? If we look. All right, so hit the refresh button. Out, ramfs. Didn't we test this and it worked? Or does it need prefix? Okay, so, the, oh wait, here's where it's installing to. Yeah, that's where it's actually installing to. Uh, if I go to source, busybox, install. Yeah, that's where it all comes out. Do you support a prefix option? All right, let's let's look at BusyBox's make file and see if I can figure out what it's trying to do. Oh, it's dash o. It's not dash. It, dash dir is what a lot of ones do, but some do. For, I guess, yeah, for output. Right. So if we do that. I don't think 720K could be done with one floppy disk. Uh, no, unless there's been advances in compression that I'm unaware of. Okay, that is progress. So let's make out dir int ramfs.
And we get an error. No rule to build. Okay, so is it not? Let's see here. Store output files. K build supports output files to a different directory. Uh. I feel like the right option here is just to move, you know what? Why am I doing this the hard way? Let me just do install, and then we'll just move the files. If that's how it wants to do it. Uh, install, out, in ramifest. Now if we look at our int ramifs folder. That that didn't work. That that completely failed to work. That Oh wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. All the K build files got ended up here. Let me let me check something. Hold on. How are we doing? Wow, 165 viewers. You got that is impressive. All right, like seriously impressive. All right, it ran fast. Hey, okay, there we go. Busy box. Um, did we not get a? I feel like we're missing a file. Nope. We also have a Linux RC, which is. A binary. All right, so that means now we need to build the RAM disk. Um, building a RAM disk is a little bit deep magic. All right, so int ram uh, create int ram ram fs. Because it's a CPIO archive, so let me just look up the commands to actually do this. Initial, okay, so all we need to do here is cd out int ramifs find name print zero cpio null create I'm I'm getting this off again to wiki format new c and then we want to uh, I guess we do want lzma compress it because we really are trying to get as much disk space as is possible uh, dash nine out int ramfs cpio lzmia okay that one doesn't work Oh yeah, let me add root because I'm not in the root directory. Okay, make build. All right, so that builds the int ramfs image. Now there's a couple of ways you can handle this. What I think for our initial go around at this. General setup. Let me make this. Let me make this bigger. 
int ramfs general setup Kernel compression mode, automatically add versioning information. Dot config, we don't want here, no RAM disk support. So we want RAM disk support. Uh, we only want LZMA because we're trying to make this as small as possible. Uh, space separated list of directory should king file system layout. Okay, so can, if I can just do file system layout. I guess I can do dash dash out int ramfs like that, and that should be valid. Because then all I should need to do is for build kernel, I could add, uh, I don't, this rule we actually won't need then. All I would need is to add build busy box. Make build kernel. See if it actually can link that kernel. Uh, directory not empty. You know, I probably should just make that a copy R instead of a uh, MV just to keep it happy. Okay, so now it's going to try building a new kernel with an integrated RAM disk. So what do we end up with? We end up with, it's not technically a BZ image anymore, it's an LZMA image. Um, but that's what it's spitting out. Alright, so let's see if we can do, if we can boot from it. Let's actually see if we can boot from it. So, fire it up. Booting from ROM. Well, it did boot. It took a bit to decompress. Uh, not syncing decompression. What? That was a lot of error output that happened all at once. Did it run out of memory? Decompressor failed. I think it. I don't think it fits in thirty. I think it needs sixty. Let's try sixty-four megabytes. Is it really, really that unhappy with that little memory? Okay. Uh. It would really help if I could read the kernel. Not syncing decompressor failed. Okay, that probably means I have a mismatch between what it wants and what it's getting. I think we're better off making the RAM disk ourselves and then just telling the kernel to use said RAM disk. Let me re yeah, okay, let me re add let me get that roll back. Make int RAM FS. Fetch busy box. Uh, build kernel. Make kernel menu config. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. Chat, I do hope that having the VS. Oh, right. The, we're on the wrong window. We're on the wrong window. Good thing I looked over and noticed. Yeah, I, I think I just goofed slightly. Let's let's take a closer look here. So int ramfs support initial int ramfs using LZMA. Built-in compression mode is LZMA. We are compiling for size, which is what we want. 
Kernel compression mode is LZ. Uh, XZ. I actually don't know which one of those is better. Like, we are, we're trying to get, you know what, let's go with XZ here because we are really trying to get, like, every little bit of disk space out of this. What's generic 4A6 support? Uh, okay. Probably should enable that, but again, I want to see how much disk space I actually have to work with. Because this is going to be pretty tight as is. Alright, save new kernel. Uh, make build kernel. Oh, that's not going to work. That is not going to work. Um, this is going to be really slow to load on a real 486. Like, I can't imagine how slow XZ, uh, XX compression, uh, uh, XZ compression is going to be. Oh, no, wait, that's still not going to work because I have the wrong source folder set. Also, we need support for elf binaries. Uh, we probably need support for scripts. Probably need the block layer, and actually we also need proc. Because proc is surprisingly not required. Okay. Let's see, miscellaneous. Where is proc? Oh, it's, it's proc fs is the flag. Uh, file systems for pseudo file systems. Okay. So that gives us proc. I'm also going to grab sysfs because that's actually useful. Alright, kernel menu config. Uh, okay, so what else do we need? So, going back to RAM desk, I probably should load this through Lilo. Like, I feel like that's going to be a thing that we need to do. CPIO uh, ZX, that's going to be what that boils down to. And I just need to fix the make file now. That can go away. Delete. That's fine. And let's see. Let's see if that works. Because if that works, then all then we need to just put Lilo fro or is Lilo or Syslinux and throw it on a floppy. And then at least the start of this is done. Because then it's going to tell me how much disk space I have to work with. Because if we let it download the rest of the system on the fly. Um, well, that's where things get kind of neat. Okay. Well, I mean, we are dealing with system, you know, we're dealing with some very old systems. I would ideally like it to basically run on anything that can run a BIOS. Um, so basically, 1992 to 2021 x86 PCs. Uh, okay. So it handles all that. It built the image. Has the image start? Oh, oh, that's a different error. Input was encoded with settings that are not supported by this XZ decoder. 
That is a new one. I have never seen that error message before. Also, Eggman, thank you for the $5 tip. And LGBRBF, thank you for the $1 tip. Well, we're going the right way on this. Slowly. But we are going the right way on this. Input was encoded with settings that are not supported by this XZ decoder. What the... Okay... Does XC have some special option for this? I have absolutely no idea. I've never tried this before. Uh, like if I do it ram fs. Alright, I think this is I think this is to a Google. I believe this is I need to Google this. Alright. Um LZ it ram fs options not supported where do i find the the right options that's a that's a new one for me okay uh hold on what was the exact error message because oh sorry i turned it off not supported by this xz decoder okay so somewhat Someone somewhere else there's input was encoded with settings that are not supported by this ZX decoder. Okay. So how do we fix this? Oh, it has to generate a CRC32. Okay, that explains it. It apparently normally uses SHA uh, SHA256, but the checksum needs to be CRC32 for this to work. Uh, and I just realized I'm on the wrong screen. So I just added this to the make file right here. So the real question is how much disk space does that leave? Well, first let's see if it boots. It has 32 megabytes of memory. And the compressor ran out. All right, let's see if we can start in 64 bit and then 64 megabytes. This is not going well. All right, let's try 64. Let's see here. Compressor ran out of memory. All right, let's try something less expensive since that's what apparently, like, because I can't even see how it's allocating. Yeah, no, it says normal 30 megabytes, uh, 60 megabytes are open. Okay, well, how much does it actually need? Because I'm now kind of curious on how high I have to go. Let's try 128. I just want, I'm, I'm curious. Okay, it needs 128 megabytes of memory to successfully decompress. And it still can't mount the root file system, but that's probably a... Yeah, okay, it's got actually quite a few warnings here. Can't open an initial console, fail to create root, no partitions. It probably needs root dev RAM to successfully start. No, I think we can get it lower. I just need to try a different compression. Um, I just don't, f I, this is not gonna fly. Uh, let's see what we can do with BZIP because I think BZIP2 is probably going to be what's gonna work the best, all, thing F, all things considered. So let's go back to kernel menu config. And then let's play with the options. All right, general setup. Com kernel compression mode, int ram fs32. Uh, we don't need that. Alright. 
so let's make sure we have that all taken care of. Let's try building a kernel. Well, it built the kernel, so let us see if the kernel will now start, or at least fail some mount root, because obviously we've got some problems here. Okay, so that did actually start with 128, so let's see if we can go down to 32, because I feel like 32 is what reasonably we're going to have to be stuck with, but let's see here. Like, I am curious on how low we can go. No, we can actually do 32 with this configuration. We probably can do 16. Let's just try 16 just for the sake of it. So it looks like bzip2 is the limit of what we can actually do. I still have to get this on a floppy, but at least we can rapidly test it. Oh, it doesn't seem to start with thirty uh, for with sixteen. Oh, that's interesting. Why? That is interesting. Does it start with twenty four? Huh? Oh, it does start with twenty four. Well, that's interesting. How big is the image right now? Just so we know. One point two megabytes. Okay, so we are actually starting to run to. We are getting to the upper limit of what we can actually fit because at one point two megabytes. If we can get net, if we can just get networking, or if we, it's not, it's not the end of the world. Hmm, I'm mulling this because right now I'm starting to because. Okay, let's let's see how much disk space we. The RAM disk. Why is it that high? Like what's the Linux, what's the base Linux kernel compiling out to? So uncompressed, the base kernel is at one point nine megabytes. Um. Yeah. So disk space that is disk space disappearing pretty rapidly. Uh, let's let's see if we can get it to boot first, and then we'll work from there. So make kernel menu config. Uh, all right. So what do we need here? I think we need to set the kernel command line default int path. Oh, is it compressed? Hold on. Uh, no, it shouldn't be compressing it twice. I don't think it's that stupid. It could be, but I don't think it is. Uh, I need kernel command line. I think I need to set it to root 
equals dev ram to get it to start. Which should be here somewhere. Let me see here. Doc config. C group. Boot config. Embedded system. What's PC 104 support? No, it's not PC. That's not what we need. Uh, compiler. Is it. Is it possible. Yeah, hold on. Just for the sake of my brain, I need to test this because I am wondering if it's bzip if it's putting a bzip file. Uh, is, is it? I don't think it's that stupid, but um, it's been a really long time since I've done this. So me build kernel because I'm wondering if it's just bzip compressing a bzip kernel. Because I can entirely see that happening. Does it say anything about copying in that RAM desk? Yeah, look, no, it actually did. I think I was bzipping a bzipped file. I think that's why it, uh, it bloated up a little bit. Okay, it's not any smaller. Let's see if anything changes here. Wait for it. Nope. Uh, I can use a pen to change the kernel command line. Let's see here, hold on. A pen. Uh, root equal dev ram, I believe is the command line I need for this. Let's see here. Failed to create. Alright, let me look. Let me look at the notes that were left to me by the other folks that have done this. Kernel utilities, support for elf binaries, append int.sh. No working int found. Ram disk source files. Boot config support. All right. I think we're, let me let's try this with a bootloader or not bootloader. Um, Qum can load in a RAM disk directly for us, so we don't quite need to get it working through. Um, if we're going to end up using Syslinux or Lilo, uh, that can handle part of that for us. All right, so let's go to general setup. and then remove this from the source file. Boot config support. I still feel like there should be an option here for setting the kernel command line that I'm not seeing. Like there's default int path. It's a bunch of other ones here that I feel like should be there, but okay. Uh, if we now just build the kernel separately from the RAM desk. Eight hundred and sixty six kilobytes and two hundred and sixty one kilobytes for the kernel and RAM disk. That kernel got a Bit, oh, because it's a lower compress, it's a different compression thing. So if we, uh, right, let's go to Q. Let me go here. Let's close this out.
Uh, there is an option. Hold on. Intrid. Yeah, it's intrid. Uh, int ram fs bzip2. Let's see if that changes anything. Unable to mount root file system. I did see it saying it unpack. Yeah, here it is. Unpacking int ram fs, but then it fails to mount root. So do I need to do uh, append root dev ram? Shouldn't need to do that. Yeah, see, it unpacks the int ramfs, so it is seeing it. And then it can't see anywhere else to go. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, int equal bin sh. Why do I have the feeling? Why do I have the feeling it's trying to do something clever? Let's see here. Does chat have any good advice for me? Because chat's probably been yelling at me for uh, int ramfs include ramfs file system not enabled uh, config command line All right, so that all right, so that's where the kernel command line is in ramfs. Int ram fs unable to mount root. Uh, all right, so why is it? Okay, so I need block dev int rd. That explains it. it. There is actually a separate config option I need to set for this. All right. So let's set that. So block layer. What was the name of the, we need block dev ram, block devices, ram block device. Dev is on device drivers, block devices. Chat, I feel like I'm losing my mind here. Oh, here. No, bus devices, generic. Okay, block devices. Ram block device. There we go. Let's pull chat back up. Okay, so far so good. 
So now let us see if we can start it up. I'm just going to try reading from ROM. Well, at least we got a different message that time. Uh... Oh, it may need RAM zero. Uh, pend. Hold on, I actually had a root command line there, so at least at least we're making slight headache. The numbers next to each line item. Okay. okay. Come on, prompt. Unable to mount, kernel offset, kernel could not be loaded. So it loads the RAM drive and then goes completely splat. Oh, there's a separate one. Hold on. There's a separate block device for the RAM desk. It's, it looks like there's actually two different ones. It is config block dev intrid. Uh, oh, I didn't realize you could actually hit one there. Hold on. No, that's enabled. that is enabled if RAM disk support is also included this also enables initial RAM disk entrance support and adds 15 kilobytes onto the kernel size it's typical purpose loads a RAM disk loaded to the bootloader lilo load in loads by root for the normal boot procedure if unsure say yes uh So we load the RAM disk successfully. Supports loading of a BZIP encoded RAM disk or CPIO buffer. That's fine. It's as far as I can tell, it's decompressing it, but we can try uh, re-adding this. So we end up with a 1.2 megabyte BZIP image. I just realized that the stream is not on the right screen. Yeah, yep, yeah, I got it. I know. I'm sorry, chat. Um, Alright, so if we just try loading the kernel directly again. I don't, yeah, I don't think that's actually working. No file systems could mount root try blah. Which suggests to me that we're missing something in the config, but Alright. So we have shell, we have support for elf binaries, RAM disk support. There's no int process. Okay, so we do have ELF support there. No networking support, no file system support, device drivers, block device. Uh, 
I'm just going to disable this for now because I don't think we actually need it. Support initial RAM disk RAMFS using BZIP2 built in compression mode. Built in config is fine. What are we missing? Nearly double what we started with. Colonel Boots tries to start int, needs a RAM desk. I mean, this example is using a gzip file, but I don't feel like that should matter. I could try with more RAM, because at this point my brain is, like, let me give it 64 and just see what happens. Yeah, no difference. So here, enable slash dev is needed. Latency, yes. Serial console. Uh... Well, we do have a slash proc. Am I... Yeah, we do have a slash proc. Bootloader's been using the internet command. Use to have dev proxys. Um, you know, let me try a. Let me try. So, in the example uh, in the. Let me find the right tab here. In the median article that I linked earlier to, they used a automated build script to, let's see here, median, there it is, uh, building it. All right, so let's just try this. Because now I'm confused. So for the very tiny Linux kernel that they did on Medium, they used kernel utilities. Let's see here. Make int ramfs. So and then this will just build a copy of BusyBox. Because maybe, maybe I am doing something wrong. Let's see what comes out of it. <sighs> All right. Well, that built quickly. So now we have a 1.3 megabyte CPIO archive. Excuse me. I think I it was a dash T. So dash T shows me everything that's on there. So what's actually included? So this image, well, it has a dev folder. Well, you know, let's just try it and see if we can successfully start with it. So let's go desktop view. Uh, kernel utilities in RAM FS CPIO. Like, am I just building the RAM disk wrong? Because I can. Oh. Uh. 
Oh, right. Uh, it won't support a GZIP image because this build image doesn't support GZIP. Okay, that's easy enough. Uh... because uh, we need support for gzip. Let that build a new kernel. And I can, well, let me make sure it'll boot with what is supposed to be a known good image before we try anything else. Well, that actually helped. It, oh, you know, it probably built, it built the RAM disk as 64-bit. So, yeah, okay, so that's probably exactly what the problem is. So, let's go back to here. Let's go back to our make file. Uh, make file is up here. Okay, so yeah, it probably built that copy of BusyBox 64 bit. So, if we want to do the make RAM disk thing, make out. P int ramfs dev sys proc build config. Yeah, there's still some definitely. There's still some places we can. Um, trim this down a little bit. It's like, I'm, I'm really just trying to get the absolute basics here, and then we can figure out what we can do from there. Because depending on the amount of disk space I have left is going to determine how interesting this project's going to be. Okay, so that built a bzip Linux file. Uh, 1.2 megabytes, so I have that compiled in. Okay, uh, so let's go to M system and let's try it now. I'm going to just try starting the bees of Linux. I gave it 64 megabytes of RAM just as a precaution. Let me try intrid uh, int ramfs bzip2, try one more time. I feel like I'm building this disk, in, hold on, I feel like I'm building this image wrong. It's the only thing that makes sense. Uh, cat infra let's see here. CPIO CPO dash T. Well, I got the files there. Create null, create. Like, those files should all be there in the output image. The empty directories are there. But there's no proc and there's no dev. Uh, does CPIO need an option to include empty directory?
I do add a dev. I, I make the dev directory, but it's you know it's probably because there's no files in it. Hold on. Uh, CPIO include empty directory. Uh. What's the other one, the one I just downloaded do? Because does like that one have files in it? Yeah, so that also has a slash int. Although that shouldn't matter because it should also look in bin int. Yeah, something's not getting copied correct I I feel like I'm doing something wrong with busybox but I'm not sure what I think I need to run the make install command well, I do run the make install command, but where does it end up? Okay. Right. I could try that, but I shouldn't need to. Uh... You know, let me fully extract this image and just get an idea. Let's see here. It's input VD, I believe would... Yeah, that would copy it all out. Yeah, so this one has empty... Oh, I know what's going on. Hold on. Fine print zero, I'm pretty sure, isn't going to include empty directories. No, it does actually. Because it's got. Hold on, let me just. If we just do a find like this, you do end up with all directories. So let me just get rid of print zero and see what it changes. Actually, I should blow away the in ramfs folder just because I've made changes there. Nope. Did not like that. Can't stat. I have both bzip and gzip enabled in the kernel just so I could try both of them at the moment. Let's see here. CPIO int ramfs. find yeah so this one this one has a different command for it so let's try this because CPIO syntax is kind of annoying uh, all right let's just try that and see what happens So that builds a new kernel.
Okay, so that one has the empty directories in it. I have dev bin. All right, so does that make a difference? Come on. Do we have an int binary on this thing? Like, did I completely forget to include an int binary? No, I do have an int binary on here. Can't mount root file system. It does unpack int ramfs. It frees some unused. Can't open initial console. Which is maybe why it's having problems. Hold on. Hold on. I'm Googling that error message, but I'm not completely certain that's useful. Okay, no, we need to act, okay, we need to create some device nodes. Um, yeah, okay, so it does look like there has to be actual device, a couple of hand, device nodes. Uh, so how do we ha handle that? So bring the application back up. Let's see here. I am currently, I'm just currently, yeah, BusyBox should be static. Um, well, let's confirm that BusyBox is static. BusyBox is not static. That that would be part of the problem. That would be an actual part of the problem. Uh, which leads me to wonder how much disk space we have to really work with here. Uh, all right, let's let's take a look here. We go to our tool chain. Actually, tool chain lib. Seven hundred and forty six kilobytes. I have this horrible feeling I'm not going to be able to fit that in here. Yeah, no, it would throw error too. Uh, all right, let's. There should be an option to make it static. Feel like this is going to be have to be a two floppy disk uh, project, but let's let's see what we can do with that. All right, settings. Here we go. Build static. And i four a six muscle. Uh, I got this. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I am setting this at compile time, but I should probably have it in the config. go and additional C flags o dash o s save new config make clean all right and let's do a complete build kernel Like, if I can just get enough of a system that I can download something, like we can load a network driver and build the rest, or load it in from a second floppy, that would, like, I don't know if you want to do it as a two floppy thing, but it might be the way to go here, because with a two floppy solution, I can conceivably fit in, um quite a bit more. I just don't know how much memory it's going to take up, but this is more of a proof of concept, mostly because I want to see Linux 6.1 do something useful on a modern, uh, on a 486. Like, I'm not pretending that this is going to be actually useful. So, let's see. If I need, the thing is, I would need something like BusyBox to get it at least started. here I should have bin format elf and uh, yeah I should have all that except maybe dev tempfs which I'll take care of in a moment actually I'll take care of that right now make Why do I feel like I'm let's see here? It might just be tempfs. Here it is, tempfs. Yes, for pseudo file systems. Uh, what else does it need? Oh, it needs shared memory on. Hold on, sm. Yeah, that has to be turned on. And to whoever taught me about this trick, I don't know where this has been all my life that you could press one there and get that to work. Like, that's amazing. And I wish I knew about that like 10 years ago. Uh, a DMF format floppy is entirely on the cards. I just don't know if it's going to be enough. I'm going to use the restroom while this compiles, so I'll be back in a moment. Uh, I'll just turn the camera off. I'll be right back. And I'm back. Perfect. All right, so let's let's take a look. So what are, what's our build image size up to? 1.3 megabytes. We are we're starting to run out of disk space here. Although I think I'm still building in the RAM disk. Um, but we'll 
check that in a moment. So let's see if anything happens when we try Hume. Nope. Same error. Unable to open initial console. Yeah, we're probably going to have to... I'd have to compile in serial console support to get more debugging. Uh... Yeah, it can be packed. It's just... I forgot, you, can you scroll up? I felt like at one point you could scroll up and down on this. Let's see here. Finds KDB, finds initial console. Can't mount rootfs. Alright, hold on. Let me try... Let me try something else. Actually, on that one, it doesn't even say it's trying to unmount the root of S, so hold on. Let me just put in the in RAMFS manually and see what it does. Okay, so no actual change here except we get the freeing intrig memory message so um hmm so what is going on here okay default kernel compression are we loading in okay so ram disk so let's take this out where it tries to compile in a RAM desk. Boot config support. You know what? Let me just check something. Okay, so BusyBox is now there stackly linked. How big is that? 550 kilobytes, which is a lot larger than I would like, but if we're going to try down, if I'm going to put wget on the image, then it's not that big of a deal. Okay. I'm pretty sure the floppy Linux manual is, I, I can look, but I'm pretty sure it's fairly out of date. Uh, links get filtered out by YouTube, so let's see here. Floppy, what's it? Floppy Linux. Okay. okay, yeah, so here's a Hackaday. Uh, okay, so there is a Hackaday article on this. Linux Live OS that boots from a single floppy disk. Search. But the, yeah, so I see a Hackaday article for it, but the link in the article is dead. Oh, here we go. All right, I just found uh, the GitHub. All right, let's, let's pull this off onto the other screen and let's take a look together. All right, so files, so BusyBox, Linux, so there, he, he is, uh, whoever did this is using a uh, syslinux based one, so files, so here's the make file, take a look at what I'm doing versus what they're doing, bz image, rebuild compile, tiny config, menu config, How busy box. So a lot of this looks similar, but yeah, I can definitely see some changes here. So this makes, uh, this is what you're putting on the root FS. He makes the console, he makes the null device, he puts an int script on it, and compiles, does it with ZZ, uh, ZX. Okay, 
Okay, so let's look at the kernel config. Let's see if there's miss something here major missing. So ZX. See what block devices. So RAM disk source config with RDZX. Config for size. This one builds for 46. Block int RAM FSD. Like that's the only block entry here and that's obviously working. So it's probably how I am building BusyBox that's causing problems. Because I'm building it as a static I'm sorry, I'm just catching up with chat. Meta page, Tark, Oracle creating it from scratch. Can boot on a 486 with 24 megabytes of memory. Uh, so it does work. This is basically what I want to do as the base. So let me see what else is here. We enabled TTY, print case support, RAM disk support. So all that is correct. So it looks like the only things missing are console and the null device and some other files as well as an int script. Let's let's try making let's try making these uh, let's try making the in, the device files because maybe that is actually the problem. All right, so that gives us console. That gives us dev null. I'm just, I, I'm, what I'm curious is how far we can take it. Let's see here. So distribution, config. Let me add a file for int tab. Okay, now we just want to copy that in. Uh, so, co well, you know what? Let me make that files. Alright, uh, so, let's see here. Yeah, I'll just call it Ben. You know what? Ah, uh, brain is having. No, that would actually be um, act because RC would go. Uh, historically, RC is in ECT, but it's not always. All right. Uh, sudo copy. So we want to copy ECT RC to out int ramifs D RC. We want to make that executable. And we want to do that again for the int tab. I just realized the sun is up and it's 7 a.m. Have I really been doing this for three hours already? 
I just realized Chad has mentioned that. Okay. You're using the direct loading function of Q. It is possible that it is having issues, but I have been trying to statically link the, you know what? If that is the problem, maybe it's worth just trying to get SysLinux working. Like, do we have SysLinux available? Like, do I have to compile it? Uh, no, I can just grab it. So let's grab SysLinux. So let me, let's take a look at this. So if we want to do SysLinux, uh, so SysLinux just wants to be a FAT32 file system. So let me, let's just make, let's just add to the scripts. Build floppy. This has to build kernel, build int ramifs. Make a high density floppy disk, format it. Um, I feel like, you know, I didn't know this existed until chat linked to me, and I always dis, you know, I. On one hand, it's nice not to be frustrated going crazy over this. On the other hand, it's like, I'm just. Well, I still have plans to do my own thing with this once we get this starting point taken care of. So, build floppy image there. Now we just need to copy the files onto it, which we can do with uh, mcopy i floppy linux dot image. Uh, okay, I need we need the syslinux config file. Alright, so config syslinux like that, or syslinux config, because maybe if that's where it's broke, because we, we had to do this part anyway, so mcopy onto there, so the syntax for this is config syslinux config colon colon which tells us to copy to the base uh, we want to also do that with out bzip image to the base directory and with the ram disk as well uh, this we have to rename just because file limitations. Well, I guess not, because apparently it does support long file names, but let's just try build floppy. Alright, so build the kernel. This is really surprising. This is surprisingly frustrated. Uh, did I make? Oh yeah, that that's gonna cause bad things to happen. Chat. I feel like I haven't had enough sleep. Um, although I think it'd be hilarious if I accidentally overwrote my root file system due to I don't know lack of sleep. Let's fix these device nodes, console, file exists, then why did it fail last time? 
Oh, it, it failed over here because uh, you need to have a directory made. Yeah, I'm actually going to have it just blow away the entire build directory here before it does. Like, this isn't very clean, but it'll get the job done. Because once we have the absolute base in place, then I can see what we can actually do with it. Because I want to do... Oh, that needs a dash F. That needs a dash F. And I probably should do that. Okay, so that completely failed to format the floppy disk. Uh, int not DAWs media. Oh, okay, hold on. Well, that's easy enough because. Okay, well that all copied over. Uh, let's see what happens. All right, so let's go desktop and just do FDA floppy Linux. different. And absolutely nothing changed, but at least it booted off a floppy disk. So now we got something that boots off a floppy disk and then completely fails to do anything useful. Progress! Same exact failure, like this is driving me a little bit crazy. Well, I it, it's progress in that this is now a floppy disk image. It's not progress because it's still not mounting. I also realize that we seem to have lost the background audio at some point, probably because it's not. Oh yeah, it's you know it's not in a loop. It should. Let me. I've got to be missing something in the config. It's the only thing that makes sense. Let me look here. Uh, make install, build stack utilities, power off, support reading in tab file, optimize for size and says speed, uh, initial RAM disk, print K. Downloads busy box, builds the image, the absolute minimum you need to config. Because it's not even getting to like loading the int directory properly. Like, it's your syslinux. Uh, I should change this so. Booting, uh, test, booting,
How much disk? Hold on. First, how much disk space do I have on this desk? So I still have um, 300 kilobytes free. So there's still quite a bit more we'll be able to do with it. Uh, actually, hold on. That ra that that uh, that is not right. 300 kilobytes. What did it copy in? Why is it that tiny? Uh, okay, so we're in the RAM disk directory. Int RAMFS. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. That wasn't one of my smart moments. I cleaned the directory that I'm trying to build. Yeah, that 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 would do it. That would do it. Uh, that wasn't one of my finer moments, chat. Alright, so... Um, I could just tell it to ignore errors while doing this, but I think the easiest thing to do here is to delete the directory and then recreate it so it doesn't fail on incremental builds. Like, this is... Ch uh, don't use this as an example of, like, good script maintenance, although I have seen far worse at times, so... Alright, that needs a dash F. Oh, thank you. Uh, screen, screen. I feel like I need more sleep. Or less sleep. I actually slept really well last night, all things considered. Uh, all right, let's, let's try this and see if it does anything. Wait for it to start up. And I've got my hand to switch it back to the other way, back to the other screen. Nope. Unpacking int ram fs. Freeing intrid memory. Listing all partitions. Could not mount root. And make sure the RAM disk, I, I am building this RAM disk correctly. There's a bin sh, there's a Linux RC, there's an RC, like, it should be able to mount this correctly. Alright, let me try root fs type tempfs, like, let's, let's just try it, because at this point, I, uh, I don't know, my brain is my brain is turning inward upon itself because I there used to be a time alright let's see if that does anything Have that distinct feeling it's not, but come on. 
Oh, that actually did something different. Wait, 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 wait. That that actually did something different. No working int found. Okay, that suggests that it did successfully decompress that. Why doesn't it like... All right, so that got something different. Uh, well, it should have been SH in there. Hold on, let's, let, what do we? Yeah, it's there. So why doesn't it why couldn't it load it? So those are all links to BusyBox. Which should be completely File permission should be okay. It's i three a six version one statically linked stripped, so that is valid. It works when I run it on here, so yeah, it's properly compiled. It shouldn't need to be owned by UID2. It should get mapped when the system starts up. All right, so what... That suggests that ELF support somehow fell out of the kernel, but I thought we enabled that. Um, kernel menu config. Okay, so bin format elf is supported. It supports scripts starting with that. Uh, it almost, hold on, uh, hold on, uh, let, let's test something. Let's see if we go into the syslinux config and tell it that its int binary is bin busybox. Does that do anything? Uh, yeah, intrid does not actually need to be there. Um, Oh, wait, 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 hold on. This this syslinux config is not completely correct. Hold on. Uh, intrid. No, because that's, I'm just copying the file to the disk as, yeah, intrid. It's not actually intrid, it's just, I, I can use a less confusing file name. rootfs dot ram. Just just to make it a little less confusing for the next person who has to look at this. Assuming anyone does. Um, but let's see if changing that message to have it try and just start BusyBox, because then it should just print out the BusyBox help message and give me some idea of what it's doing. Oh, RD end. All right, I feel like a lot of Linux is, I feel like it's been a long time, such such a long time that either all of this changed out from under me or I've completely forgotten how it works. It 
If anything, I would think it would need to have um, absolute file names, but let's see. Uh, the two colons means that copy to disk image. No, look at that. It actually did run BusyBox and then killed Int, but, um, okay, so it doesn't like something about how I'm building this RAM desk. That is, that is actual progress. Let, let me try putting RD Int as SH. Let me let that rebuild. Okay. All right, we are now, it, it is going the right way. Thank you so much, chat. Um, I bought a stack of 50. Oh, whoa, 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 we got into a shell. We got into a shell. I am deeply confused on why it took this much pain to get into a shell, but we got into a shell. Alright, if I type exit here. Alright, let me let me see. Can I just set to int and then have it start? Like I feel like I don't need to actually do that, but We're not done yet, chat. We still have quite a few things we're going to need to do um, to make this, to, shall we say, realize the dream of computer torture that I have in mind. Okay, so bad in tab entries, line two, three, four, five, six, uh, and then it dies, okay. So, why doesn't it like the int tab? Did I put the int tab in the wrong place? Huh. Uh, well, hold on. Let me let me fix a few other things. These notes are actually really invaluable. So whoever linked me to Lopiex, thank you because this is this is giving me. I'm at least identifying some failure modes here that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. Although it does mean I'm going to have to build this as root. Alright, so definitely going in the right direction. Okay. Oh, I realized I had a few um, mega uh, the a few tips and super chats to read out. Mega, thank you for the two dollars super chat, and I am hoping to make it available in the Restless System store in the not so near future. Or in the soon to be near future. Um, wow, words hard. Also, typing hard. 186 viewers. Let's see if that actually, let's see if that works. All right. Well, it is trying to start with int tab. I think I just gotta find a proper int tab and it'll actually, you know, 
start. Uh, like, oh, you know what? Here, here's uh, there's actually an example in tab in the busy box source code. I'm just gonna use. I'm just gonna ship that. Make it someone else. Okay, like let's just try. If that's all we need, build floppy. I feel like I need to put a remote control to someone else on the stream to be able to control my views just in case I uh, keep clicking on the wrong one. Did I copy RC to Intab? Did I really? No, I did. Wait. Chat. 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 I did, in fact, do that, and it hurts. This is fine. Okay. It's not, I'm not as tired as you'd think I would be. Uh, I am really going to have to build this as root, aren't I? Like, that kind of sucks. Actually, I probably don't. I probably could just, I probably can get rid of this line and then... I might be able to fake root, but I really don't don't want to. You know, I can grab a Red Bull from the fridge. Oh, why did it... Hold on. I, I'm, I'm about to step away and then think... Oh, hold on, because I probably didn't save it. I It shouldn't care about the user. I'm going to grab a Red Bull. Sadly, Red Bull doesn't seem to give me wings. Alright. Alright, let's see what happens when we start up now. Chat, I think it's progress, but not as we would know it. This is going this is going so well. This is going wonderfully well. This is fine. <laughs> this is fine. Um I know what at least I know what happened. It uh it needs the TTYs. Oh, well, that's easy enough to fix. Uh, so your TTY... Well, it would be whatever is in the int tab. So what does the int tab care about? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's probably... Yeah, that's probably all I have to care about. So that is... Four, one... Yeah, it's four, one, and the minor is... Uh, 
see if that does it. Oh, well, don't you... Don't you need... Hold on. Wouldn't I need dev... I, I thought I would need you, dev, to populate these entries. Because I thought you, dev, did that. But folks are telling me... Dev temp FS. So your dev temp FS. Oh, okay. So apparently you no longer need you, dev. But I do have to enable it. So make kernel menu config. Yeah. I feel like a lot of Linux knowledge has completely fallen out of my brain. Auto mount. Alright. That's fine. Save the config. Alright, so if that works, then I should be able to get rid of, like, all these device node things. And then let's see if see if it works. Okay, it's going to rebuild the kernel. Well, at the moment... We're not testing on real hardware, we're testing on Cube just to make my life a little bit less miserable, because this is going to be pretty miserable in places. Uh, but I'm looking forward to trying this on the Cursed 486. That is actually... You know, I actually like the taste of Red Bull. I know a lot of people think it's it's ick, but it really never has bothered me. So what are we currently doing? How are we doing on disk space on our floppy disk? Uh, we've got 38 kilobytes free. Okay. I'm pretty sure there's some low-hanging fruit that we can do to reclaim some of that disk space, but I am starting to feel a little bit more optimistic about this project. Alright, let's see if it'll actually boot. Nope, nope, doesn't boot. Uh, I pro. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I probably have to have a mount script for that somewhere. Don't die. Uh. It's probably in the RC script, although I don't think it would get that far. Here. System int do first time is you know the other one that I looked at the other version of this file was a lot simpler and I don't think we're gonna support multiple VTs although we probably should. Alright. If busybox works fine without intab, if no intab is found it has the following defaults. Um I have the distinct feeling it's not running this RC script. Stuff to do is run int. So, do, hold on. Do I just need to add mount tab? Is that even a valid file system identifier? I mean, there's dev PTS, but I don't have the actual... Oh, no, that is correct. Dev... But the Linux kernel says... The Linux kernel option says it would automatically mount it for me. But is that actually the case? Okay. Uh... Ch -ch -ch -ch. 
Wrong file name in int rt tab. Yeah. Well, this was the one I grabbed out of their example one. Um. Alright, so make build floppy. Probably should also, like, commit things to get because we're making headway. I got I got update the git ignore file to ignore the out directory. Yeah, there we go. I'm gonna have to think of some like catchy name for this. Okay, all right, it's got that. Uh, we're using Syslinux. I was going to use Lilo, but uh, Syslinux proved to be easier. Let's see what happens when we let it boot. Like, does it do anything interesting? Do we have a shell here? Yeah, okay, so that ain't helping. Let me look, let's see here. If we look back at the copy, the really tiny Linux, the flo uh, floppy Linux. Let's see here. Floppy. Floppy Linux. Uh, int ramfs, or hold on, int tab. So I just want to take a closer look at what this is being done here. Files, tab. So the int tab that he's using is a little bit different. Uh, so sysint runs ect rcint asked first. Alright, you know, let's just try this because I don't think I want to actually support multiple V terminals. It's a neat, you know, it's, don't get me wrong, it's kind of cool to support it, but let's try and get something a little simpler working first. Oh, you know what? We may not even have multiple V terminals enabled in the kernel, which would completely explain why it doesn't work. So, let's see if that makes it happy enough to start. And I realize I've had that on the wrong image for a bit of time. I really need to be better about keeping this up and running. Uh, press enter to activate this console. No such file directory. Okay. Almost there. We are almost there. What is missing? That means it's probably... Where is that quote coming from? Bin sh. Seer. I'm looking at where the. But I don't. Oh, 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 I see it. That probably needs to have a space. I have the screen correct. Uh, I think it's just chat lag.
Why is that off centered like that? All right, yeah, I'm just gonna remove that and just I uh, ho hope there's less magic involved because I don't know how much more magic my life can take. I feel like the magic levels are a little bit getting a little extreme. I probably inserted a Unicode. Um, like, it wouldn't be the first time. So I press enter to activate the console, no such file directory. Yeah, there's gotta be a Unicode something in there. It's probably the easiest thing. Alright, let's hold on. File, act, and tab. Nope, that's correct. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Because Windows. I'm going to be kind of annoyed if that makes the problem go away. Okay, now we've gone to can't run that process. Can we activate this console? Hey, we can activate this console. We actually made it to a shell. We still have problems, but we have a shell. Okay, now we are starting to get somewhere. Like, we are actually starting to get somewhere with us. Okay. Um... Bare Metal TV, we're basically, I'm basically YOLOing it, although I am taking notes from a few of the other people who have been, um, who have done things like this over the years. Okay. So, it couldn't find that script, so it tells me that I'm probably copying it to the wrong location. No, it looks like it's there? Well, I... Let's see here, hold on. Bin SH. Alright, let's just take a closer look and see why that script doesn't seem to be being found. Okay. Yeah, I'm going... That's why I'm checking right now, but I might as well boot into the image and see what's actually there. RC not found. SHXRC. Oh, that suggests that there's a line ending error. Yeah, there's a line ending error. Oh, I gotta find it. There is a. There's. I think there's a way in VS Code to tell it never to use CRFL. So that's rebuilt. Try starting it up now. Oh, that actually worked. That is okay. That is actually working. Uh. We are using 2.1 megabytes of uh, memory. 2.1 megabytes of memory, and we have a lot available because we have free memory. No, it's it, it's a git pro. It, it was me 
doing a bit of silly. All right, so how much disk space do we actually have to work with right now? Because if we can get some network drivers... Actually, hold on. You know, how much disks... Like, let me bring the application back up. MDIR floppy Linux. So we have... We're using 1.2 megabytes right now, but there's some low-hanging fruit that we can do to get some space back. So, um, my, my 486 has 64 megabytes of RAM. Um, but that's because I intended to run Windows Millennium Edition on it. Uh, there isn't a whole, yeah, it's going to be, let's actually load up 86 box and see if it will start. Uh, 86 box is not a hundred percent accurate for this because I know it, I have seen cases where it will allow newer CPU instructions than what it's supposed to, but it's, yeah, I'm just doing the configuration for it in the other window, so bear with me. So let's make this a, actually let me drag this over here and you can, I'll let you see what I'm doing. So desktop view. Uh, so this is just the VM that we were using the other day. So let's go to a 486. Socket 3. We need a DX. Yeah, you know, let's go 25 megahertz. We'll be here for a while, but I'm kind of, I kind of want to see it actually work. Alright. And then start. All right, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it up like this. Yeah, it's fine. Let's do the very brief CMOS setup. All we need is a floppy disk drive. Uh, I guess I'll let all detect the hard drive just to make it happy. All right, let's see if it works. Um, well, my works, my my four A six. Um, is cursed. It has an upper limit of 128, but I just have some very large sims in there. Well, Mega, the problem is that if the Im kernel was uncompressed, I'd need three floppy disks for it. So, um, compression is kind of a thing we need. Okay, I guess I don't have a hard drive in this VM. You know what? That's fine. I'm... I'm not going to worry about it. Alright, let's just put the disk in. Uh, which would be on... Sorry, Linux. Right, well, let's see what happens. Well, there's SysLinux. I expect this to take anywhere between 5 and 10 minutes, chat. And while that's going, I'm going to create a proper scene for this. Alright, so 86 box. Uh, oh, nope, that was not what I wanted to do. Alright, duplicate, cube. Oh! Kernel, f booting kernel failed invalid argument. Invalid argument for what? Oh, and I just realized you're seeing my starting soon screen.
Loading RAM disk. Okay. Invalid argument. Hold on, hold on. Uh, I have a sinking suspicion. I know where the problem is. I have a sinking suspicion. I know where the problem is. I am guessing. If I had, if I had to guess. The early kernel decompression is done uh, in assembly. I wonder. I wonder if there's bit rot there. Let me, let's try it on a Pentium. Let's like, let's try different configurations because at this point I need to figure out what exactly has gone wrong. So let's, let's go up to, uh, yeah, let's go up to socket. Yeah, let's go with an Intel Pentium at, at 60 megahertz. Okay, that's fine. Oh, it's a wind bias. Loading BZ image because we should be getting to decompressing kernel. Because right now it's just loading it off the desk. Oh, okay. Chat's missing on this scene. Uh, I'll have to fix that. One of the things I dislike about Stream Beats is on OBS, you can actually split it. There's probably got a way to do it. Where I can edit it at the same time. Let me oh, let me fix the chat box. Okay, hold on. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. I'll have to fix that later. That's fine. Invalid argument. Booting kernel failed. So where is that problem coming from? Yeah, just that's the error message we're getting here. So let, let's do some investigation. Uh, source Linux. That's probably, yeah, okay, that's not where I, let's see here, including kernel failed. I don't think it's getting into the kernel. I think we're dying in syslinux. Alright, let's, what's the exact error message? Right there, hold on. Booting. Fix hand over to the kernel. Booting. When was this released? 
6.03, and what are we currently... Okay, so no, that that's... Fix hand over to the colonel. All right, so it loads. Let's let's take a look up here. Like I want to understand what's going on here. Uh. So com thirty two. Um, Elf Link. Uh, let's see here. LD Linux. Kernel. So it loads file. Yeah, hold on. Booting. So it tries to run this function after it reads everything. So where does it do this? Okay, so include... Lua source syslinux. I have that distinct feel. I, 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 all right, let's see here, syslinux. So what do you, what are you actually doing here? So you stitch together a kernel command line. Creating kernel, kernel command line failed. Loading kernel. Uh, we get, do we get that message? Yeah, we get, well, we don't get this exact message. We get something similar. Loading intrude failed. Uh, Linux boot returned. I'm confused. So this print, these printfs, boot image, creating kernel, kernel command line, loading kernel hyphen s. Yes. No, that is not. Hmm. Let me catch up with chat because chat's been typing up. Oh, okay, so I need an older Syslinux. I'm using the version that, uh... Okay, so if we just need an older Syslinux, that's easy enough. But the thing is that we're using 6.04. Linux, it's there. Uh, so the Nico, we're using Syslinux zero dot four, but maybe that's a regression. Fix over handover booting kernel invalid argument.
com okay so com lib lib syslinux load linux I'm just confused on why it works on one but not the other. Six dot six dot zero four appears to be an unreleased git um git version that they shipped in Ubuntu, because that's the version I'm using. I'm just very confused on why it works on. Hmm. Yeah, we're definitely on the right track. I just gotta figure out why it's happening on real hardware. Uh, cause I gotta figure out where it's it's kind of blowing up right now. I'm I'm almost wondering if I want to try using Lilo, but Lilo would probably require me to jump through additional hoops. Um, hoops that I really don't particularly want to jump through. Yeah, it may be worth trying. The, the, the thing that I'm confused about is why does it work with... You know what, let's see if there's a working config with 86 box. Like, if we go all the way up to Pentium 2, which is about as high as you can go. Yeah, Pentium Pro. I am just curious if the problem goes away. Just trying to like I want I want to try and isolate this down. So it starts loading BZ image. It really shouldn't be all that different size-wise, all things considered, but Lilo, I feel like I'm going to have to jump through a lot of hoops to get working, but I want to see if it's a pen, let me, if it's a compile, I want to see if it's a compile issue, let's see what happens. It does run correctly on a Pentium Pro. Uh... It's unhappy for other reasons. Oh no, it, look, it is actually running on a Pentium Pro. Genuine Intel Pentium Pro, 90 megahertz. Uh, okay, that actually implies it is simply a compile error. Uh, we just have to rebuild it. Okay. So that means we just have to rebuild Syslinux. I, I think if we just build Syslinux for a 486, the problem probably will go away. All right, so, yay? <laughs> like, I don't know if yay is the right term to use here. Um, how do we compile Syslinux? Like, how, all right, let's take a look here. Uh, if we just look at the Debian, Debian rules, it'll tell me how the basic compile works. Because I have that distinct 
feeling I can't just like, let's see here, Syslinux install. Because it has to install, yeah, so there is an MBR here that it copies, but the MBR I would assume is there are two possibilities either does this sys linux on a 486 having a problem or it's the linux kernel decompression code that's having a problem uh, and I'm not sure which one of those is the good or bad one For floppy disk, it shouldn't be LBA versus CHS. I'm, I'm mentally thinking about how the kernel starts. Essentially with a, uh, like, uh, let me open a new window. Because at this point, I, I have to track, I have to track the code. Because I don't know how far into the kernel we're actually getting. Because we may actually be getting into the kernel start, and then it dies immediately after. Uh, so let's get in there. Double Flash, thank you for the 50 euro uh, super chat. Seriously. Okay. I gotta think about this one. This one's actually gonna be a little bit tricky. All right, so when the kernel starts up, it has to decompress itself. And that is done, where is that done? That's done in boot compressed. Very two bit startup code. Okay, so it starts loading high Prevents the linker. Calculate the delta or compile it to the run. Is this the st this? Uh, I don't think this is the decompression stub. Let me see here. Copy the kernel. EFI stub sets up the BSS. Jumps to new kernel. Oh, push arguments for extract kernel. Here we go. So extract kernel is where it gets decompressed. Uh, so where is extract kernel end up? Because I am, like, I have this feeling that we are actually making it into the kernel and then it dies. So arch x86 boot compressed miss.c. So we end up here. And this loads the decompression subroutine based on the type of kernel that we are using. And then this sets up early print k out the serial console. Uh, looks to see if the kernel is a valid elf image. Compresses it, uh, moved to position. So this is where it loads in. Okay, so it's failing me. Okay, so Chad's telling me I'm looking in the wrong place. So if it is failing in SysLinux. Wait, are they using CMove somewhere in SysLinux? Because that's not going to work. No, they are not. Uh, 
I am using a 4A6 cross compiler for this, but I haven't built my own Syslinux. Yeah, you know what? Let's, let's actually do that. Uh, make CCI... Hold on. That's doing a lot of compiling. Python not found. Can I do Python Python three? Like, am I that lucky? Yes, actually, apparently I am that lucky. Nasm not found. Okay, that one I can grab. <clears throat> Although I noticed that this is compiling for M Arch I three eighty six. Uh, yeah, I can. Hold, you know, I can put the face cam up here. One hundred seventy viewers. Wow, folks are really into watching me suffer today. You know, I'm happy to keep streaming for longer than I intended, but I think at eight thirty I'm going to take a ten minute break and just eat something for a bit. So, uh, something failed. Let's see here, let's look at the chat. So that's there, it's looking for... Goes through all these directories, and then falls over here. BIOS core. Do you have a make file? No, you don't have a make file. Uh. BIOS core dash dash prep core not found. Okay, that exists. Oh, I know why you don't exist, because you have LD Library Path time. Okay, now this I have to use the system compiler for this one. Alright, so here may is this have a like a menu config or it's like is there any config options here? Uh, real firmware, private, blah, 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 debug, there's ISO Linux debug, no, it's complaining because 
I tried using the Muscle C compiler and it didn't like that because it tried to run certain binaries. If I just type it using the system compiler, it should be fine. I, I've actually had plenty of sleep. It's... I'm hoping to get back to videos at some point. Like, it's a combination of burnout, just general depression about things. You know, it's like... I talked about this at the beginning of the stream, but I, I've been going... Well, I just noticed that some commands are missing. It's trying to use UPX, and there's obviously some other things missing here. Let me see if we can figure this out together. Like, I enjoy doing this from the day to day, but a lot of times it leaves my energy very drained. And sometimes when the stream doesn't work out the way I hoped, like the free DAWs one, it can kill my enthusiasm for quite a bit. It's why I'm kind of debating mixing in some uh, non-tech content, just to keep it interesting for myself. Like, I'm seriously debating doing a Factorio stream. More specifically, I would want to try the Warp, ta uh, warp, ta um, warp Tasmio uh, mod, which basically turns Factorio into a tower defense game, and you still can't find Python. I still feel like I'd be better off trying to use Lilo for this, but I'd have to format the disk in the right format for it, but... Lilo is also quite a bit simpler. Okay. Yeah, like, a whole lot of things there just kind of broke. Because of course they did. Well, it, with, in Warp, ta it, um, uh, make sure I'm saying the name of the pack right, um, Warp, ta uh, the whole, it, this, yeah, wow, wow, that was a language, me trying to speak this here, Factorio, uh, Warp Torio is what it's called, I'll actually put a link to it, like, I've been tempted to do this as sort of an on the side thing, uh, intermix with it. The idea of it is that your your factory gets transported to a new world every couple of minutes, which you can extend with research, but your starting building, your starting platform generates pollution. So it makes it, you have to build a factory in a very confined space. It seems like an interesting enough challenge um, and so forth. The biggest problem I have with doing ham stuff here, besides the obvious, the obvious problems with doing ham on YouTube because of FCC rules, is um, getting an antenna set here would be quite difficult. Also, I'm looking at my stream, um, and I realize how bad the lag is because... Yeah, it's like the lag is really in the past. At least on my console. Chat, I'm going to take a five minute break on this because I am not having any ideas. I will return. I will return at 825 because at this point I I need to I need to stop thinking and collect myself. You no, know, it's more specifically because everything is in ULS, and I, I don't know. It's doing ham stuff on air is just not something I really want to do because it's inherently doxing yourself, even though my call sign is known. So, like at this moment, I'm not sure where I want to take debugging this. And I think I want to stretch my legs. Like, I think I'm going to just run downstairs and so forth. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm going to put the AFK screen up. I will return in... Yeah, I will return... I will return 8.25. I'll probably be back before that, but like I said, I just need to stretch my legs.
All right, I'm back. I walked, I just went downstairs, got a little fresh air, and thought about it for a bit. So, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that could be doing this. If it's trying to do, I don't think it's a memory map issue because it's successfully putting the kernel Okay. It's successfully putting the kernel. If it was a problem with the E820 call, it could be a problem with E820. You know what? It could easily be an E820 problem. How does SysLinux determine the memory map? Because if it's using E820, that will not work on old kernels. Because, okay, um. This, this needs some explanation. Um, when you try and use something above conventional memory, oh, the problem doesn't the problem doesn't happen in QM, so that doesn't help me. E twenty is the down gets the memory map from the kernel and gives it uh, and basically tells you where you can and can't load stuff into memory. Um, And it's used all over the place. Yeah, see, it's it's used here in BIOS core. So if E820 is giving a bad response, it could throw out the whole thing, and an old system will not support E820. On old, old systems, you would have E88. I believe it's E88. Like, if SysLinux requires E820, that would explain it. Um, let me look at the change log, because there was something about that. Okay, I'm not copying. Let's see here. Version. Uh... Well, invalid argument tells me it's getting a function failure from somewhere else. I just have to figure out where. Uh, we need to be able to build it. That's what it comes down to. So let me see if we can successfully depack build depth syslinux. Because then I can... All right, can I do depack build package dash b? Uh, I am using stripped, but I'm using both stripped kernels and BusyBox. It's about as small as I can get it. So let's see if we can let's see if we can compile a new SysLinux version. Because if I build it with the Ubuntu build script, I should at least get something resembling the actual shipping code, and I can just install as a new DAB. No, EA20, EA20, uh, I want to say was 98 or 99. Most 486 systems will not support it. Like, Memtest86 will actually print the memory detection method it's using. Um, and OS Dev has an article about it, but I'm not certain if that's, if I'm looking in the wrong place or not. We, we need to get some more debug code in there. And thus, I need to be able to build SysLinux. My other thought is to try Loadlin. Actually, you know what? I'm going to... You know what? I am going to pull the chat. Do we want to try... Um, I'm curious. Because if we can Loadlin the kernel from FreeDAWs, it would at least tell me for sure it's a SysLinux problem. But I don't see how it could be anything else if we're not actually making it into the kernel start script. Into the into head, head 32S, which is where the kernel will start executing code. Uh, also, hold on, my phone just went off. I just want to take a look. Who is sending me a message at this time of day? 
Oh no, just a just a friend of mine re telling me. Um, yeah, I, I we normally I have a call that I do on Tuesdays and just confirm we're not doing it because July fourth. All right, so that's building, and it's build installing. So this will spit out a bunch of dev packages. So now I can patch the code and change it as need be. Okay, yep, all right, so that's everything in SysLinux. Yeah, okay, so that completely that completely succeeded uh, just because I don't have the secret key for, because I am not Michael Hudson Doyle, I can't sign this package, but that's fine. But I can recompile it. Yes, I can recompile it because there's the Syslinux stuff. Uh, Loadlin. Uh, the only system I have that is an actual 4e6 is the cursed 4e6. I'd have to get it out. It's. I'd have to get. I've had problems with the streaming setup. That's why it's not currently out. All right, so. We can rebuild this. We have the technology. So, if that's the case, let's go to the Debian folder. Debian rules. And, okay. So, make install arch so how does this build its files because I think I have to set C flags here it's let me oh let me see if C flags would get set anywhere oh uh, is this looking at the wrong screen no I'm just down in the lower corner okay and folks want me to try load len All right, so let's try Loadline. Um, let me find a copy of it. Loadline. I assume Loadline is not in the Linux ar in the Ubuntu archive. Oh, it actually is. Okay. Uh, I have no idea what install varlib dpack. Uh, okay, so installs loadlin to user lib loadlin. That's load blend. Uh, I need my fr I need a free DAWs disk image, um, or I need a disk image. Uh, all right, so I do have this base image that I can copy. Mount C users, or you know what? Let me copy load blend out. Mount C users and commander desktop 86 box. That's not going to work the way I expect it to because I still need to have. Oh no! You know what? I can use two floppy disks for this. There's no reason I can't do that. Okay. So let's let's get 86 box up and running. So let's go back up to desktop view. 86 box manager. Free DOS testing setup. So let's try this on the Pentium Pro configuration first. Let's add a second floppy disk, the floppy drive like that and then let's start it up well 
That resolution ain't right. Right, so don't move the free DAWs window while it's starting up. Lesson learned. All right, so let's put the base image in. Restart. And then set up the second desk. Just, let's make sure that this is a problem with SysLinux. Alright, and then save changes. So then let's put in the second image, which is on Linux, Ubuntu, Home and Commander, Source, Floppy Linux, Floppy, all right. So can you read that? Okay, you can read that. So load lin b bzip image b rootfs ram. Okay, it's loading. I expect this to work. This is still in the Pentium Pro configuration. And there it goes. Well, it didn't load the RAM desk. Uh, okay, so why didn't it load the RAM desk? Did I do it wrong, or does it just not support that? But it did start the kernel, which is a good sign. should be able to load a RAM desk. So Z okay, so maybe it only want it only supports a Z image file? File system be passed as kernel f uh, as root. Load file. So I guess it would be load lin b vz um, b zip image intrad equal b. I don't think that's gonna work. Um, uh, Loadland should be able to load a RAM. I, I know it has to be able to load a RAM desk because basically, almost in a lot of cases where you're using Loadland, you would still need a RAM desk. So it should be supported. And RAM disk support is older than dirt in the kernel. It goes back to one point two. And Loadland was pretty actively, like, I remember seeing Loadland for a long time. There it is, loading in, loading in RD. Okay, so that's what it ha that's what you needed. 
Yeah, it's still gonna die because the kernel command line's not right, but at least now we're getting somewhere. No, I'm packing RAM disk. It did actually load the RAM disk. It didn't successfully boot, but um, we're going the right way here. Uh, what was the command we used for this in the other thing? Okay, so this, these are the options we have to pass. Probably don't, well, we probably do need the RD int, so load lin. Root fs root fs type temp fs rd int equal s I tend to do long streams. Oh, we did get a shell. It had actually booted. Okay, so we can start from Loadlin. Now the question is, can we start with Loadlin if we're on a 486 configuration? That is the million dollar question right now. So let's do 486DX at 25 megahertz with 32 megabytes of RAM. Okay. Jump into the setup because we have to fix the settings. So it did boot. The question is, will it do it on a 4A6 now? Granted, an emulated one, but still a 4A6. Because at least then I know for a fact it's a syslinux problem. So load lin um, bz image intrid I wish I could remember the command line root fs type equal temp fs rd int equal s Let's see what that does. Wow, that's a lot slower. Chat, let's find out if it works on a 486. Because at least we'll know the kernel runs on a 486, like an actual 486, granted an emulated one.
Lodlin showed up in a lot of weird places. Like, I never used it back in the day, but it was a lot of times if you started a system up like with Windows 95 and then Lodlin to kernel, you would end up with a more working config because in those days the kernel had trouble initializing some hardware. But if Windows initialized it, it worked. Uh, well, poo, that didn't work. It. Okay, that implies that there is a problem with this running on a 4A6. So, let me explain what happened, because if you're not familiar with how an Intel processor works, that probably did not make any sense. What happened there was it booted up, it tried to boot up the kernel, it loaded the RAM disk, it jumped into the kernel by clearing the screen, and then it bombed. Which suggests that it was an illegal instruction somewhere. Are we on a DX processor, just to confirm? Yes, we are on a DX processor. Let's try a Pentium and see if that changes anything. Pentium over... Yeah, Pentium Overdrive. It suggests that there's problems that need to be resolved. Uh, 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 I, I, I didn't figure... It, I, I, I was optimistic when I thought this was going to be relatively easy. I'm not giving up that yet. I've come this far. It's either a CMove instruction or it's a compare and exchange aid instruction, and I'm not sure which. Uh, if it's if this is a Pentium, it should have CMove was Pentium Pro, so uh, I you know I'd have to check that. Yeah, I did compile it for a 486, but I wouldn't be con I, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't work. The question now is finding where it doesn't work, which is going to be easier said than done. Yeah, I'm load loading from uh, free dodge just to try and isolate what is causing this. So now we're trying it on a Pentium, and it immediately crashes and boot loops. All right, I think we need early print K. Oh man, how the how the hell am I going to do early print K? Because uh, 86 box doesn't support redirecting. Um, well, shit, this is an actual problem because I don't know how we can early print K. Uh, that's suggesting it's triple faulting with the way it's rebooting. It works on a P2, it works on a Pentium Pro. Tells me it's a problem in the kernel. That is a kernel problem. Alright, let me, let's... Let's look at the kernel source code. Let me see if I can figure out what it is doing. Arch 86, is it doing an E820 somewhere? Uh, you know, I need to be under bash. Okay, because 
So it does a whole lot of E20 stuff. Uh, it should be doing that in early boot. Yeah, let's take a look in kernel setup. Okay. Yeah, actually, let me read the documentation for early print K because I feel like I'm going to want this. Like, where in the documentation... Usually early print K is over serial, but on x86 you might be able to do it. Let's see here. All right. Documentation arch x86. Here we go. Early print K. Uh, doesn't quite help me. Because that talks about using USB, and we are talking about technology that predates early print K. Uh, print, print, yeah. All right. Early print K console x86. Can we do that? Write kernel output directly into the VGA buffer or serial port. Useful for kernel. Uh, all right, let's see. All right, let's try that. Let's just enable early print K and see what we get out of it. Oh, right. You know, it helps if I'm in the right directory. And if I have my C compiler in the right place. Okay, I want both of these yeah all right and hold on let me move uh i'll move myself you know i'll move myself to the upper top left hand corner just so i'm not blocking anything all right let's let's rebuild the floppy see if we get any interesting debug info out of this I have the distinct feeling we're going to be doing a stream debugging this. I am seeing, you know, chat says it's an emulation bug. Um, Cume does not properly emulate a 486. It will it'll emulate more than what a 486 is actually capable of doing. Uh, the main reason I haven't tested on real hardware is I don't have a machine handy to do it. So let's see if we get anything useful about early... So if nightly 86 box can output to serial, let me go grab that. 86 box. Uh, download experimental, I guess is what I need. Okay, yeah, let me grab, let's grab the latest 86 box. Because if that can dump it out to serial, that will actually help quite a bit. All right, so let me grab all that. 86 box. Place files. Alright, I'm just install I'm just copying the other eighty six box stuff while uh eighty six box manager testing config. Uh, 
Ah, here we go. Serial port pass through. Chat, that was perfect. That appears to have exactly what I need. Let me bring this up. So I grabbed the nightly build. So serial port pass through one. Uh, where do I want to send it to? So it wants to go to a named pipe. Uh, I would like to send it to a file. I guess I can connect Putty to this. You know, I, I think I should be able to connect Putty to this. All right, let's see if I, we can do that first. Let me, do I, please tell me I have Putty installed. Uh, I apparently have the Putty installer downloaded. I just apparently don't have it actually installed. Because we'll have to connect to the serial console. That is a very welcome feature if that they now support serial ports. Alright, I gotta try and keep up with chat. Let's see here. Okay. Uh let's see. Here. Just Alright. So get that taken care of. Alright, so let's start putty. Connect to I think I can do that and it will work with putty, but we'll find out. Alright, let's see, let's start it up. Cause then I could do C T T Y oh wait, this will be maybe not. Alright, let's see if Putty can connect to this. Most doesn't exist. Uh, okay, I gotta figure out how to get that to work though. Uh, 86 box pu uh, putty serial redirection. Serial port pass through. Here it is. Uh, okay, here's the bug report. I'm just currently looking. Transport, CMake. I'm just looking at how you actually use this. So pipe name, um, uh, well, right now, you know what, I did include it with the VGA driver, so maybe we'll be able to get something out of that before I have to actually go for all the work of trying to get this to work. Alright, floppy links. I am starting to hit my limit, but let's see. Let's see how much further I can get. Load lin. You know, what? I should put this in a shell script. Just so I don't have to type this command every time. RootFS type, tempfs, rd int s bin, and then early print k console. You have to put it on the command line. I remember that one. Uh, early print k. Okay, I guess it's just early print k. Oh, you know, I just realized you probably can't see what I'm doing. Oh, no, you can see what I'm doing. Wow, for once I actually got the screen settings right. Okay, uh, start line. Let's see here. Well, I still need to figure out how to connect the other hand side of the terminal, 
but early print case should print to the VGA buffer on x86, so maybe we'll get something useful. If not, I'll... I might have to get the kernel debugger out, although if we're dying this early, I don't think it's going to help us. It does imply the problem is with the kernel image, though. Oh, also, apparently I have um, missed a uh, super chat. Um, okay, so it didn't print anything out, or it did it too fast for me to actually see it. Joy. All right. Uh, so how do I get this redirection to work? <sighs> Serial port pass-through configure named pipe. So there's the pipe name. What can listen, um, putty named pipe? Okay, so apparently I just typed this into the serial field in putty. Is that like, I feel like I already tried that and it wouldn't let me do it. Serial. All right, so there's putty. And let's just see if I can get something to come out of it. Echo test com one. Hey, look, there's test. Okay, so we do have a working serial port. Uh, all right. So if I want early print K to serial, print K serial. Early, okay, so I have to give it early print K, all right. So edit start lin dot bat. Serial TTY zero one one five two two. Oh boy, this brings back memories. This, <laughs> this brings back memories. I don't think I've had to do this since um, doing ARM bring up. Although I don't even ever remember having to do early print K. Usually because by the time I would get the kernel, the kernel team was done with it. All right, let's see if we get anything out of that. That is an incredibly useful feature because I can do some really cool stuff in the future with that. Like, if I want to show multi-user DAWs, which was one of the things in my project list for a while. I just wish this booted a little faster. This is a little painful. Also, I don't know if I enabled serial ports in the Linux kernel. I just realized that maybe we need to enable that. Yeah, we didn't get anything out of that. It just immediately restarted. All right, let's try on a different config, which let's try on a Pentium Pro config. Yeah, Pentium Pro, uh, just so I can see that the early print K is actually working. Well, the baud rate should, oh, Ever reading from serial device. All right, let's make sure that's working. Test com. Okay, yep, so we get test. Start when. So this should start because this is a Pentium 2 or a Pentium Pro. I say Pentium 2, but yeah, it's Pentium Pro. Well, right now I want to make sure I'm getting debug messages out of it at all. Because if I don't get any debug messages out of this, then I have something wrong with my config. 
on a named pipe, the baud rate should not matter, but uh, we can. Ch I'll check it in a moment. Oh look, yeah, no, look, there it is. Early console and extract Linux, and then it starts up. Early console stopped. So we're not even getting. We're not even getting to extract kernel. So. Okay, so the early print K works. We're dying very early in the boot process. We're not even getting this far. Yeah, so we're not even getting into kernel decompression. All right, so if that's the case, where is where is this kernel message come from? Because it means we're dying somewhere higher than that in the boot process. It is possible that extract code is in fact using an illegal instruction. That could entirely be what did it. Uh, so x86 boot compressed. So how do we get here? So this is where the current. This is where we are early so so we get here to extract kernel okay so that's where this comes from so this is where we are right now so let's look backwards kernel tool size extract kernel because if we're not excuse me Boot parameters mode seven. That tells me we're loading off VGA. Uh, where's the 86 debug uh, panel? I haven't used 86 box for development. I wasn't aware that it had a debug console. Okay. Problem is without VZIP compression, we're, we're not even getting that far. We're getting, we, we're basically dying in the kernel early initialization stuff, which suggests to me that we're not getting anywhere of the kernel map but I could be wrong. Yeah, so we get here. Early console and extract kernel. So when we extract kernel, where does that come from? Like, I feel like that comes out of, yeah, that comes out of head 32. So we are dying incredibly early. All right, so how, let, let's walk, let's walk through the kernels. Um, let's walk through the kernels early boot initialization code. So it loads a GPT. These symbols need to be marked as hidden, prevent the linker from re blah blah blah. Relocatable, load physical address. Also, I would like syntax highlighting, please. Are you kidding? You do not know how to do syntax hiding on assembler? Search marketplace. Uh, okay, install the extension for assembly. Oh, okay, that's nicer. Yay, I, can, I have syntax highlighting. There, there are a few things in this world that make me sadder than coding without syntax highlighting. So it sets the boot stack. We don't have the UEFI entry stub, and it shouldn't matter, and then it goes basically here. Yeah, it basically just does a bunch of basic math and then goes kablooey.
Because ultimately when the kernel starts, we should end up right here at simfunc32, uh, sim function start 32. And you know what we can do to test that? I'm going to do something really... I'm going to put an infinite loop in. If this causes a hang, then we are dying somewhere in the code past us. If we don't get an infinite hang, then we're dying somewhere else. That was not what I wanted to do. Why make build floppy? Did I change a config option? Oh no, because I'm in the wrong folder. I'm in the wrong folder. Oh, hold on. All right. Config CPU sup Intel. That's all right. Let me see what that does. Kernel menu config. Let's just see if that helps. Hopefully it doesn't make the kernel too big. Because uh, disk space is becoming a little tight. Uh, that config option activates processor quirks. Although, again, I feel like it's a little bit too early in the boot process. That being said, this kernel should completely hang. Because I'm having it get stuck in an infinite loop. So we get relocatable. We get overran during the copy we just did, or during extra. Uh, we point to the arch and copy of it. Because the kernel assumes that we're already in protected mode. Hmm. Well, I would like you to work on as many x86 systems as possible. And it still fits in a floppy disk. How, how, um, how's our disk space doing? Oh, we still have 36 kilobytes. That's... That's plenty. Alright. So, let's try this again here. Uh, I got to eject floppy. Actually, I need to do that again because 86 box sometimes writes the floppy when you eject it. I something I've learned the hard way. I have that distinct feeling that not a lot of people have, uh, you know, there's a bunch of people that make 4A6 compatible Linuxes, but it hasn't been tried with, the, I've only seen it with the 5.1 sort of stuff. So this, when we start Lin, should hang. And that's expected, because I put an infinite loop in. All right, so start Lin. You're probably, yeah, you're complaining because you lost your connection. So restart session. Oh, I just had a realization what might be missing. It might need ISIS support. I don't think I have that compiled in, and it may need it on something this old. But let's see if it gets to... Oh, screen. Yep, yep. Sorry. You haven't missed much. It's just loading. 
Okay, it got stuck in an infinite loop. It, this is on the Pentium Pro. So let's try it on the not so Pentium Pro. Uh, I probably, I, uh, you'd think after two years of doing this, I would be better with handling the screen stuff, but I usually don't need to switch back and forth like this, so this is a little bit new. Alright, let's see here. So if this, if this gets stuck in an infinite loop, what it tells me is we're dying, it's for some reason getting bad values earlier in the extract process. Where it's getting those bad values from, I'm not certain from, but at least, at least it's going in the right direction, question mark. I really hate debugging this early in the kernel boot process. It's... Well, we don't need that because there's going to be no early print K. We're, we're, dot, we're going to try and get into an infinite loop before that. Now that's interesting that it didn't go into an infinite loop there. Which means we're not getting out of load lin, Or we're Failing the trampoline now. Okay. Uh. That was not what I was expecting it to do, so now I gotta think about this. Is there any code that runs before startup 32? I can't think. I can't imagine there is, but maybe the. I'm more familiar with the ARM code than I am with x86, but... Okay, no, there is a real mode stub here. Hold on. x86... Real mode. Here we go. So, real mode... Okay. So, if this is... So... RM, so real mode. So what is the actual start factor then, if we are starting in real mode? Is that here? All right, let's, let's just walk through this code and see if I can figure it out. Real mode header. Okay, so that sets up... Some, so somewhere in here, it's got to set up it's got to set up a GPT because it has to set that up for going into protective mode. So, BIOS calls, so these get copied from slash slash boot. Yeah, so this is a 16 bit, uh, 16 bit code. This handles memory copy routines in the early kernel start. Well, I'm not certain it's a problem in Sys Linux. I it's because I can make the same problem happen in um, I can make the same problem happen with load blend. Okay. So a header boot sector start. I don't think this code is used. But let me let me flip through it. Hold on. No, this is probably used to generate the elf header for yeah, this code is probably it's not used. Or it's not used for what we're currently doing with it. So we have real mode header, it's what is the entry point? You know what? Why don't I just ask Google? Because Google will know this. Linux XA6 32 bit entry point. OK, 
Because this is this is actually documented. Hold on. Let me tear this tab off so we can read this together. Okay, memory layout, reserve for BIOS, command line, kernel setup, kernel sector, uh, real mode kernel header, sectors 512, loads, and then it looks at offset. That's all correct. So it reads a bunch of bitmask fields, which come from the bootloader. Relationship between headers, what's missing, kernel info, RO data. Uh, BIOS stub is created for boot parameters, so it's not available to BIOS based bootloaders. Setup header is predominantly limited. Kernel requires a heap stack to be set up as well as memory allocated for the kernel command line. It is needs to be done in real mode accessible memory in the bottom megabyte, so conventional. Uh, so loading the rest of the kernel is BZ image. The kernel is a BZ image file, protocol is greater than 2.0, and the load image file flag is set. You know what, the easy way to find it is, I should just scrap the code for LGPT. That's, that's, way, that's the magic thing that does it. So arch x86, uh, it's gotta be around here. Real mode trampoline 32. Okay. So let's take a look at real mode trampoline 32 because that's where it's got. Real mode. This is only used to uh, boot secondary CPUs on SMP machines. But is that comment accurate? That's a fascinating question. It's only used for booting secondary CPUs because each CPU, when you do a multi-user, on a multi, on a multi-processor start, each processor core will start in real mode, so you do have to give it a real mode trampoline. Okay, that makes sense. So I don't think this is what I'm looking for. Not what I was looking for, x86. It's gotta be in here somewhere. Uh, purgatory, if it's in purgatory, it's probably not being used. Boot, oh, here we go, boot compressed. Maybe that is where we end up, boot compressed. I feel like we looked here before, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, this looks like the code that we looked at before. So this, it toggles the interrupts, determines where we're loaded at, but we're code 32 here. Loadland doesn't enter protected mode as far as I know. No, it can't be the compressed algorithm because if it was the compressed algorithm, we would have made it into the, um, we would have made it into uh, the infinite loop in Hong, which was what I was expecting. Yeah. 
Yeah, we might have to try an older Linux kernel. It's just... That's pain. Unless it's a problem with LoadLin on a 486, which is entirely possible. I'm trying to think if this could be a LoadLin problem. Like, what is. Let's look at LoadLin source code. Because at this point, I can't roll anything out. Loadland source code is at least a lot simpler than SysLinux, and obviously they're both having problems, but I'm getting the idea that we are dying very, very early in boot. So, uh, so Loadland, make sure I've got this up on screen, and I do. So it loads all the vectors, it sets the VGA mode, it sets the root develop device. This is the boot uh, boot kernel protocol. Type of loader, old one. So V version. Like what I don't understand is why is it not want to start on an actual 486. Just seeing here if anything is giving me a hint. Intercept boot setup.s before going into protected mode. Data must be in low mem data reference. On switching to protected mode from server. So is it switch? Hold on. Is it actually switching to protected mode here? Because if we're switching to protected mode in Loadland, that would actually explain some things. Curious, where are these other files? Like, are these just different versions of Loadlin? Because I'm looking for the CR free register loaded by server. Okay. Yeah, I probably, you know, I let me see if I can figure out how I get debug messages out of 86 box. The, you know, why am I doing this right? Debug messages. I'm just looking at the 86 box documentation right now just to see what is going on. Um, fault errors. I'm trying to remember, like, I don't ever remember seeing it. Oh, it's CR0, not CR3. Okay. So it's trying to detect if it's in protected mode here, but are we going into protected mode? Doesn't look like it. Uh, 
I'm not actually sure which version of it's here. No, it's a 32-bit build, apparently. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can pop open the debug window. Look for an OR that sets the PE bet. So this tests the PE bet. Is equal or greater? Set PG bit. I'm looking, really, I want to see the code right before it YOLOs the kernel. Have boot sector, new boot sector. Uh, must start low, keep searching, do not patch. No change in RAM disk, no option. So this prints all the, okay, so this is the files being loaded into memory because it's printing the dots. No RAM disk. Go switch, go move, call kernel move down. So now it's the job of setup. Oh wait, is this where it... Switch to protected mode and return in 3D6... Re That's a function call. That's a function call. That feels a little scary. <laughs> Switch to protected mode and return in 3D6 real mode. All right, so run it under command. All right, well, let's try it. Uh, all right, so if if it will give me debugging messages here under command, a six box. Yeah, see, it doesn't actually give me any debugging messages. It just opens the window, uh, and then does that because there's no config file. Okay, let me see if, let's take a look at that LKML message, because maybe I can figure out, I can get an idea of what that's actually going to need. Uh, LKMO 686, not supported. Uh, let's see. Can I make you an approved user so I can I can make you a moderator, but I can't make you an approved user so you can post the link. Uh, I am actually struggling to figure out where to debug this because at this point I'm a little bit lost on what it's doing. So Loadlin sets, let's see here, some, Loadlin initializes E flags, checks that E20 is set, loops forever if it's not. Well, you can change the, um, you can change the flags and get the command line output, but I'm probably going to have to run this under Linux or something of equivalent. Hold on, I got. I really have to think about this because I was not expect. This was not the issue I was expecting to run into. If we're dying that early in the boot process, we're tri the processor has to be triple faulting. It's the only thing that makes sense. You know, I have an idea. I don't know if this is right or not, but I do have an idea. I just want to roll it out. Because we are loading high mem in 86 box. Let me just not do that because Loadlin doesn't actually require it. And maybe that's what's causing it. Come on, 8. F8. I don't think 
that will make any difference. Although my actual 4A6 did not like starting up if high man was loaded or a memory manager was loaded. It works. Um, it works in Q. Let me just rule this one out for my own sanity. Even though my sanity is escaping very, very quickly. Because if I load this up in QM, it loads just fine. It, it's literally failing in 86 box and probably would fail on real hardware. I would have to dig out the real hardware. Uh, okay, let me let me see if we can get the debug console out. Uh, if it's dash dash debug when starting 86 box. Was that supposed to do something? Like, is it writing a file out somewhere? Not seeing a file get ran out. I think I'm getting st I think I'm stumped. All right, let's see here. Or slash debug. Yeah, no debug console. Just look for the preferences. Yeah, I think we're going to, um, I really don't want to set box, but I think I might have to. All right, uh, download current. Yeah, I will, I will grab, uh, boots. Yeah, 2.7. All right, let's install it. Does this at least has a debugger? Alright. I vaguely remember that the plugin setup though is not yeah, this is what I remember. The actual setup is kinda irritating. Uh do we have a config that we can load? Not really. It doesn't even have a Pentium config. Yeah, like, I choose Pentium and then you get a CPU ID of Pentium 2. That's why I don't like using this emulator. Uh, log file, CPU ID, memory, disk and boot. Alright, well, I can put the floppy disks in and we can see what happens. Uh, so we need the free DAWs disk is there and we need the second type of floppy is going to be on the Linux. Home. Alright, floppy Linux. Both these disks are inserted. They are both that. Right, so save state. 32 megabytes of memory. All right, let's see if that's enough to actually start. Oh yeah, this is the version of the code that has the infinite loop and it works properly. RIP. I have a distinct, a distinct feeling, um, Uh, 
Uh, Jokum, what was that GitHub issue? Was that a GitHub issue on 86 box? Or a different one? Because I am legitimately get, starting to get stumped. Oh, there is a CPU. CPU not in real mode, unsupported function, but this is the version that this is the version of this disk that has an infinite loop or not. Hold on. Maybe maybe this is the version that does that is not infinite loop. Hold on. Just test it real quick. Yeah, no, this is the one that I made stop in an infinite loop. did I call my make file floppy build floppy I would really you know like alright so let's see here alright so let me look at that github bug 86 box uh, issues Console, uh, console. Okay. Uh, fix console window even when not requested. Force debug. Okay, so code commits. So dash dash eighty six box debug should force a debug something to show up. Oh, hold on. You can enable 86 logging to file. Maybe I can get something out of its log file. Because uh, I'm looking at 86 box manager. And it has that. Let me just see if the let me see if the log file now that I have logging enabled has anything useful for us. Because at least it would narrow it down. So let me make sure I'm not missing any super chats or anything. Um. Oh, sorry. Uh, Steven Greer, thank you for the $2 good morning super chat. And Evola Project, thank you for the nine, uh, 6 euro super chat. Play library is that in Booch I mean Booch started. At least uh, it should have started. Unless I goofed up the floppy disk image, which is entirely possible. So that crashed and burned. Did it leave a log file that we can use? It actually did leave a log file. Oh, illegal instruction. That is actually what we needed. Illegal instruction, 55FB. Five, five, uh, uh, I need an opcode chart. XA6 opcodes 55FB five, 
What would be 5-5? Five, five? It looks like a cardinal value. 5-5... Five, five. Serial pass through, config loading. Like that looks like a that looks like a card. FFB. Uh. All right. Well, that's something. Let me let's let me figure out what that is. Okay. So, illegal instruction, halt reset pending one, halt reset pending two, and then it goes Kaflui. Uh, it's probably, I gotta see here. Your FB opcode x86. Right, oh yeah, because it's a little byte and the in byte order. Alright. FB is set interrupt flag. But 55 is an invalid is not a valid opcode. Um No, that's a push instruction. Push plus register. Or I'm reading this instruction chart wrong. Okay, hold on. Let's grep for this. Just in case this is somewhere, like this is a cardinal value somewhere that we have a misaligned image. Yeah, that doesn't help. Also, I like there's a file called satan.s, which really says a lot about that particular driver. Alright. Uh, attached to it, might be showing a larger part of a string of bytes. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let me let me let me read this. Let me read this patch, because if that's in fact, oh, okay. So one e is, okay. So illegal instruction. Let me just read this from Linus. Actually, let me. Let's tear this off. Let's let's read Linus's stuff together. Uh, I think most Ori enable nothing of its uh, do fairy two bit developments. We do require x86 exchange uh, compare and exchange sixty four. Since some odd CPU clones that actually do support the instruction, but do not report to CPU ID because of an old Windows IT bug. Uh, we got rid of i386 support and you can also get rid of emulation right, let's go further up in the thread because so we do okay twice series so old that it doesn't try to use I feel like this is happening later in the boot process. Like, what file are we in? Like, let's go find the actual patch, please. Uh, page tables, blah, 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 blah. Unique patch. What are, like, is the patch here? Okay, the patch is here. Make sure I keep chat up because chat is being is helping quite a bit.
See, I don't think we're getting this far. Like, I think we're dying a lot earlier in the build pro uh, the startup process. Let me keep going down this thread and just see if there's anything. Um, wow, people are still shipping 486 support. So opcode is... Okay. Crashing on STI. Let me... Uh, STI x86. Isn't that... Yeah, that's set interrupt flag. Well, that seems like this is related to the code that we're looking at right now. So maybe we are looking at a kernel regression. All right, hold on. Hold the, hold the boat. If this is a kernel regression, let's figure this out. Let's try building an older kernel and see what happens. Because the reason we have this entire script is to make this theoretically easy enough to do this we might have to mutz with the config but let's make clean let's try this with a linux 5.15.19 uh, kernel all right because that address is not gonna work uh yeah I will say that this is a fascinating process. Um, I believe 515 is known to work on actual hardware, but let's let's test for ourselves. Because then this may be a regression in the Linux kernel, and I kind of like the idea of sending a patch to Linux kernel mailing list about this if this is in fact the problem. Because then we can start bisecting it and figuring out what actually broke. Uh, obviously I need meant to do more than that, but floppy. I will say this has been an adventure. Um, Byron, I could try existing 4A6 floppy, but I'm kind of interested in figuring it out for myself. It's part of the enjoyment for me. Oh, you know, you might be right about that. It could be encoding with the process, the issue, but it doesn't tell me where it's going boom. That's why I want to try this with the 515 kernel. Just to, just to rule it out. Oh, I'm pretty sure if I send, yeah, Well, I don't really care about this as long as it fits on the disk, and if it doesn't fit on the disk, well, I can make an extended density floppy drive, floppy. We're not caring about <coughs> actual real hardware at the moment. No, but the addressing mode might be, which, although I can't imagine what changed between a 486 and not so let's let's see if we can work this out like let's actually sit here and debug this because this is this is actually proving to be kind of interesting not for the project i was intending to do it for but um so let's see if it'll start with a 515 kernel because if it starts with a 515 kernel then we know it's a regression if it doesn't start with a 515 kernel, then I am doing something wrong. Is my audio too soft? 
Uh, actually, funny enough, the only machine I have that has an extended density floppy is my next station, of all things. And frustratingly, it needs a uh, 2.8 megabyte disk to install old copies of Next Step, <coughs> as I learned the hard way. I should really do more of that machine. I that was that was of all the moments of this cha like this channel has done a lot for making my life a lot better. I I talked about it at the beginning of the stream, but sitting here and doing things on YouTube does help a lot when things get kind of shit for me. So, you know, I, I really do appreciate how much of... Well, it rebooted. That's interesting. Okay. Let's try starting from Syslinux. Uh, actually, starting from Syslinux probably won't help. Let's make sure it still starts in Qum. Uh, which would be this one. Oh. Popped up. Decompressing Linux. Yeah, and then it starts. Okay, so that does exactly what it's supposed to with a 515 kernel. Well, the thing is that if it's getting into the Linux kernel and it's dying early... You know what, hold on. Let, let, me, let me be smart about this. Hold on. Is it dying with the same error? Like, let's, let's get the log file running. Uh, because I set, I did set the log file, 86 box, log. Yeah, so it did die again with the same exact illegal instruction, and it's dying at that memory offset. And, oh no, hold on. If I use adder to line, I should be able to see exactly where that's happening. Hold on. I, I've got, we have the technology here. But before I do that, did the the offset did not change? So nine six two seven seven. Oh yeah, hold on. I should verify the version of the Linux kernel. It shouldn't matter because the disk image automatically gets built. But you know what? It, I can't take anything for granted right now. Also, you can see the early print K running right there. All right, so uh, proc. Yeah, Linux two five fifteen one nineteen. Chad, I'm legitimately stumped. <sighs> because it works on a Pentium Pro and fails on a Pentium. So push DS. I guess I need to attach a debugger. Uh, let's see here, hold on. A6 box debugger. I do have Visual Studio installed. Just, uh, so 
trap already. Compiler. Like, I'm not convinced we're getting into the kernel. Let me get a hex adder out because if it's not decompressing, then that code segment should. Uh... Do I have a hex? Uh, hold on. Extensions. Hex adder. Yeah. All right. Let me grab a hex adder. And now let's take a look at the kernel binary. So, x86 boot bzip image open anyway in hex adder okay cool so now let's see if that code series is in here so we are looking for like if we look for this code segment we're looking for 55bf here Or not? Can I not search for hex? Uh, control palette. Okay, apparently you can't search for hex code because, of course, not. That would be way too easy. <sighs> catch up to this. I am using a 4A6 cross compiler. Uh, because we're looking at the compressed bin because the compressed bin still has a decompression stub before the compressed data. And we're not getting to the point that we're extracting it. Because we're not getting the early print K data out on serial. Uh, we're not even getting to the infinite loop code, which suggests to me that we are dying very, very early in this process, but I'm not certain where. The address from 86 box suggests... You know what? I need Greedra. That is actually what I need. You know what? And let's, let me just grab it. Because Greedra will be able to disassemble the stub, and I can at least look at what it's doing. I just really... Uh, no, I should have Java installed. Let me grab... Let Greedra download. Chat, this is escalating rapidly. Um, I can search in hex code. Okay, hold on. Oh. Uh, no, I want to search... Oh, search in binary mode. So if I'm searching in binary mode, five five, uh, five five what? FB. So F one. Is that it? Right there. Hold on. So, I'm looking for... That's an F1. Let's keep looking for it. Just trying to see if we can find that byte string anywhere where it makes sense, but that might just be what's pushing into memory and not... Okay. Alright, so 1E... Uh, it would be, what would be the byte order? Would it be 5-5? Five, five? Oh, maybe. 559F, five, 551E. Five, nine, five, five, Let's see, here's FB. Would be FB 5-5? Five, five? No.
that's why I feel like it's a memory issue, but I am drastically confused on why it's going kaflui. It's like, it's not jumping into the right code segment, but... Maybe that's... Zero, zero, one, zero. We're in protected mode. Or maybe we're not in protected mode. Because it does this with SysLinux, it does it with LoadLint. Well, if it's a CPU cache problem, I would have to get the Curse 486 out. I have no... I could. No, I have to get all the cables out. It's. I really don't want to pull it out unless I have to. Well, I tried putting in... I tried putting in an infinite loop at the start of Head32... On a Pentium Pro, it gets stuck into an infinite loop, which is what it was supposed to do. On this, it dies, which tells me I'm not getting into... At least, I'm not, if it's getting into the Linux kernel, it's not even getting that far. Uh... 96.277... So, when Loadlin loads the kernel into memory... I don't think... Lo Loadlin shouldn't be decompressing it. Yeah, okay, so I am in protective mode. Uh, I can't easily get into Discord right now. Um, well, hold on. I want to see what's at the start of the BZ Linux file because I'm not sure that I'm looking at the right place in the source code. That's kind of why I'm pulling Greedra out right now. Right. Yeah, okay. Greedra's, uh, Greedra's extracting in the other window. Hundred and sixty one viewers. Alright, let's see what else we can manage here. Um the biggest pro uh let's see, what's the easiest way I can put that floppy image somewhere? You know, I guess I can just put in get. There's there's no reason why I, I can't. Uh except for the fact I really don't want to, but All right, let me let me get this into a quote unquote good condition. And then let's build a new image. Yeah, I can squash it out later. I just don't really like doing that, but eh, whatever. Let, let's build it with the 6.4 kernel and then continue figuring out what's going on. Uh, while that's going, I will get Greedra set up because Greedra will at least tell me if we're getting... It'll at least give me a better idea of how the BZ, BZ Linux image actually gets created because that's the part where I'm a little confused too. Oh, right. I don't have the GADK on this system. Oh. Chat, my soul hurts. I can't really do I really feel like I'm starting to lose my mind here a little bit. I can use object dump to get the assembly listing of the star of the BZ image file. Because it's an ELF file, we'll do that. That'll at least give me a readout that I can look at and see if I can understand how Humpty Dumpty goes together. Let's just wait until it finishes compiling. 
the problem is that you know yeah I will I'll let's see here uh, is Wingit part of the standard system yeah let me uh, let me grab the JDK while I'm waiting for this it's probably something I want I'm going to need anyway so uh JDK 17. Well, it says 17 plus, but let's see here. JDK Windows. I'll grab the installer. Alright. So Java is going to install. While that's going, let's let that go in the background. Uh, so we have the bzip image file. So the bzip image file should still be a kernel executable image. I should be able to objump this. If I do object disassembly bz image head n 300. No, it doesn't recognize the file format. Of course it doesn't. Well, that would be to be like too easy, won't it? Uh, I'm a little surprised that that doesn't know how to disassemble that. Can I? I guess there must be a header. Um. I guess I need to look and see how the BZ image file is actually created. I am actually getting quite tired, so I don't know how much longer I'm going to keep at it, but let's just see here. Like, how's the actual BZ image? Here we go, BZ image. Setup.bin, uh, VZ Linux, kernel is ready and tools build and then that builds from a compressed one so it's this setup.bin file where does that come from okay so that setup.bin comes out there I really feel like I'm way over my head on this, but let, let's see here. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Uh, so set up the... It looks like it gets compiled to L, so can I just do a... I can do a disassembly dump here. Okay, hold on. Because this looks like this is the early initialization code that I was looking for. Uh, refresh. Here we go. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. This is the early initialization code uh, that basically does everything for starting the kernel early. So, if we look for, um, let's see if we can find that FFE1, what is it, not FFE1, it's FF, or uh, EEFB, five, no, it's 55FB. Five, five So, hold on, this is the code that runs like right at the start, so if we can figure out where this code is compiled from, we can shove an infinite loop in it and see if we're even getting here, because if we're getting into this binary, we're at least getting somewhere. So let's go right to the top of this. So, we're looking for message loop, 
start a setup. Uh, and that goes, that's in header.h. Actually, this does look like the very early, um, this looks like right where it would start. Entry text. Right, because this starts the, and then it jumps to C code here. So if we do a, we do that. Oh, objects, that's a... I don't know, when I get in a mood like this, I kind of just keep going. But now my interest is kind of peaked. Like, let's see if it gets stuck in a loop now. Because if it gets stuck in a loop now, then at least we know we're making it into header.h and we're making it somewhere into the kernel. We can then, through trial and error, try and determine exactly where we're dying. I thought four six. Uh, I thought he, it had been removed just yet because it's still uh, kernel four six is still has M four eighty six support in it. But uh, I still can't start a five fifteen kernel either. Chat, look, it hung. It actually hung. We are making it into the Linux kernel. That is progress. That is actual progress. Doesn't look like it, but that is progress. Okay, so now we can figure out exactly how far into the Linux kernel we're getting before we go ka kaboom. Um, so the question is, do we make it do we make it all the way to the call main here at the end like that is that is an actual bit of progress here yeah we die too early we don't we don't even get early print k yeah, so we do decompress. Well, we don't decompress. We get into de the decompression stub, but it does tell me that, uh, oh, okay. Uh, I added this file a little bit badly. So now we just need to figure out where exactly we go kaputski. So all we gotta do is move the infinite loop further and further through the boot code. Well, I don't think, I think we're getting junk data somewhere because that doesn't look right to me. Yeah, so it did as, I'm calling that a win. Like, the fact of the matter is we have, I, and also I'm learning a lot about how the Linux kernel works at this level. Like, I've done dev, kernel dev on ARM, but it was a very long time ago, and I only ever played with drivers, so this is...
I'm not giving up. I I have come too far. It's not the first time I have ran a kernel patch for this channel. It's not going to be the last one either, I bet. Now we just gotta keep moving that infinite loop further and further into the code until we discover where it goes boom. Okay, so we do make it through all the early initialization code. We make it to main. So where, so we do this, so that means we are now here. Uh, and I am suddenly seeing deep magic. All right, let's find main. We should probably add debug to our early set list, although I'm not sure. What does validate CPU have? Like, is this? So that says sets IO permissions, copies the boot parameters into the zero page and then jumps into protective mode. So let's put the loop here, right before we go to protective mode, because let's see if we get that far. Well, I'm, apparently I'm determined to debug this. I, 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 uh, well. I question my life decisions. Also, I think I lost my emulator. Seriously. Uh, 86 box. Oh, it, it's stuck on the other window. Well, I want to get... Uh, we're, we're at least... We're narrowing it down. I do find it, I, I like, if I do submit a patch to Linux kernel mailing list about this, I feel like it's going to be hilarious and painful and hilarious. Start when. Uh, it's having a little bit of an issue just because some of these functions are assembler, or in assembly. Also, I realize I should have added debug to the load lin command line, but um, a little late there. Okay, so we do, look, it is still hanging. All right, just to confirm that this is not, like this is actually working, let me remove that and make sure we still get the triple fault. And then go to protected mode. Yeah, see, I click it and nothing happens. So we'll have to find that and then figure out where it goes kaflui all right and uh i'll add i'll add debug on that so let's so go to protected mode is in boot pm oh that looks complicated all right so hold on Go to protected mode. 
So, A20 gate not responding, it does... So this is basically everything it does right before it makes the jump to protected mode right here. And it tries to go to code 32 start. So... We're, we're we are we are chipping away at this. So first, start Lind up bat. Okay. Uh, we're debugging the Linux kernel. Very slowly because we're dying so early in the boot process that I'm not even. I, we don't even have early print K yet. So this should just reset. I'm just making sure we're, yeah, okay. Just making sure that we haven't accidentally changed the side effects. I didn't mean to close that all out. Uh, all right, so let's let's go into an infinite loop right here before we go into protected mode. Because if we make it right to this point, then it tells me that everything up to trying to enter into protected mode works. If we go into an infinite reset, then one of these bits of code is the problem. And then it looks like we try to jump to code 32 start. I'm not sure what code 32 start is. The problem is that if I make a video out of this, how do I explain this? This is this is a GP a GDT things that mo that be, things that people. The less you know about this, the happier your life will be. Why do I make my life overly complicated? I could have just done a nice, simple DAWs boot this, but no, I am debugging Linux on a 486. It's a bug in the, it, we're not certain if it's a bug in the kernel. I'm trying to isolate exactly what's causing it. It could be an emulation glitch, but the looks like it, it might be a kernel problem. Because I can't find any reports that anyone's gotten modern Linux running on a 486. The last reports that I could find were from the 5X branch, but I couldn't... Oh! Oh! That's an actual debug message out of the kernel. Early console and setup code. We are making progress! Very slow, painful progress, but we are making progress. Okay, so if we're getting there, that means that the protected mode... Jo okay, so... Does that... Uh, how, wait, I have printf. I can print debug messages. This is exciting. I have a way to get deep... I can get debugging messages out of it. <laughs> uh, I, I kid you not. Uh, having a working printf is a luxury. Early console... Like, do I in setup code? So where is that being done? Okay, so I can just put out stuff and get messages. That's good to know. Uh, so now it tries to figure out code 32 start. So where does this value get come from? A 
Okay, so let's look. The boot document actually describes this. So why don't we read the? Why don't we do you know do something unusual in this channel on RTFM? Uh, x86 boot code 32 bootloader hook see below the address to jump to in protected mode the load address is the kernels used by the bootloader to determine the proper blah 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 yeah so here's where if the real <coughs> If the real mode kernel is not loaded at, it gets moved there later in the loading seconds. So are we actually getting into this code 32 start? Okay, so we, where are we ending up after we do this? Because we should be about ready to make the jump into protected mode, which means all our registers are set up and good to go. Uh, data segment is set up, boot parameters sets up. Code 32 start. Is that like a symbol that I can care about? Looks like code 32 start comes out of load len. If your bootloader is running in a particular hostile environment, such as load. Such as Lodlin, that runs under DAWs. Uh, use the following hooks that are invoked in the kernel as a last... Jump to immediately after, before the kernel's uncompressed. Which makes me feel like we are loading garbage. Where are we trying to go? Like, I feel like System 32 Startup is where you would actually want to land, because this is, like, this feels like where you would want to come out, given the everything, but obviously it's not. So video mode, I.O., ISO, early serial console, copy, BIOS call, uh, CPU. That may be it. Um, OX, AX, X, X, B. Oh, wow, that, I'm, I'm not even going to try to say that again. That actually may be it. Hold on, let's disassemble that. You may be actually correct on that. Arch x86 boot. Let's look at our disassembly, because the disassembly might tell us... The, okay, so we want the go to protected mode function. Here's our, our disassembly. Here's the go to protected mode. So, how does this get assembled? We want to go right to the end. Right before we do the trampoline. Protected mode jump. Is that the function that we are calling? Yeah, protected mode jump. Mm -hmm. 
It's having some dis. It's having pro. Like right here, it goes bad, and then it goes question mark. Because this looks nonsensical. This looks like a nonsensical disassembly. Or no, uh, long mode jump. Or no. The fact that that comes out bad is a little bit concerning. So detect memory. Okay. I uh, it's gas. So yeah, it is AT&T syntax because it's gas. How's it getting DS? Um, like, do we have an alignment issue here? So hold on. Where is this red, this DS thing? Uh, maybe it's in boot. Here it is. So it moves the DS register. Uh, move wide. God, gas syntax really just causes my brain to go crazy. So it move move wide, so that would be 32 bit into I got you know I gotta look up gas syntax because gas x86 syntax. Cause that looks like it's moving it to zero, but that doesn't make sense. Or wait, hold on. Move, move W. Move segment register. Move W copies the first operand to the second, including data from a descriptor. The descriptor contains data, and the opcode that we die on is push DS, which tells me that I think we have junk data going somewhere. Code 32 start. Set up GBT, set up IBT. Does the DS get initialized at any point? Because this shove this shoves four bytes down. And our actual error code out is the top four bytes are masked. which implies that this is actually where we're dying, right here. You know, I'm going to comment, this is not, I want to see if this changes our boot, our, our start failure. Because if this is where it's dying, at least we know why it's dying, where it's dying. I am curious if this is going to change the illegal opcode code that we get in 86 box. Well, we can't put it after because that function call will never return. Uh, and with puts, I, I really can only do a string thing. I, I don't have printf. So I would have to write 
code to handle that, but yeah, we'll de I'll deal with that in a, a bit. I want to see if the illegal opcode changes. Because this looks, because you're seeing, a, I'm seeing, you, we shift four register, four bytes on a Y that, and we see a push DS as the opcode where it goes kaflui. Okay, so that did, okay, so that got into a reset loop, which is exactly what we were expecting to see. And that did not change. Nuts. Uh, I'm not sure if it would or would not have, all things considered. How does the protected mode jump work? Because that's the next thing I, I care about. Okay, so here's here's how we trampoline into protected mode. Short serialize on free a six four a six. This is where protected mode jump ends, right here. So it's it froze CR0PE, moves CX to boot DS, moves DI to boot TSS. It encodes the long jump opcode manually. With that offset, it sets the code segment register and pulls the red, and this would get compiled to raw binary code, and then it lands here in lin pm32, and I already, what is tr? Okay, so load task register. Executed. Sets up VT to make it happy, and then it jumps to the 32 bit bit entry code. So the question is, do we actually make it into this? This is actually getting really interesting to debug. All right, so the question now is, are we making it into protected mode? And the way we find out if we are making it into protected mode is let's put a, let's put a loop in. If we continue to hang right here, we have made it into protected mode. Because <clears throat> it tries to set flat. The fact that I see stuff that says make um, Intel VT happy makes me a little bit concerned. Oh, it's interesting. We are. Uh, when did we get this early print K? I must have done that. Seen that earlier. Okay. Protected mode is when we switch to 32-bit processing. Uh, it's basically when your PC stops emulating a 1981 uh, XT. Uh, yeah, I did remove my for loop, or I. I thought I removed my for loop. I did not remove my for loop. So this is not going to do anything useful. 
Control C. Thank you, chat. Let's try that again. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, so we died there when we tried to jump into... We didn't make it into protected mode. Um, short jump to serialize on 3A6, 4A6. Do we get here, right before the jump to protected mode? question is, if that's the case, why didn't we make it into protected mode? Actually, hold on. Did the error, did this change at all? Oh, it did it? Well, we got the halt. We have a additional halt reset pending, but I don't think that means anything. Uh, oh yeah, you know what? One is actually already used. Uh, the, the, go me. Uh, hold on, that test was completely invalid. Uh, jump test. We need to retry that one. Oh yeah, that's, that's me installing Greedra, but I don't think we actually need it anymore. Okay, all right, that's built. I don't think that's gonna make any difference, but let's just see. Because if we're making it into protected mode, then it both gets interesting and both scary and less scary at the same time. But I don't know what the 32-bit entry point is. Uh, I assume that's entry 32, but I know we're not getting there. Oh, right. That's also not going to work. Yeah. Uh, although, gas should actually be smart enough that I it shouldn't have a problem with that, but... I'm not certain what that DS function is returning. I don't have any. I have access to printing stuff, but I don't have access to like printing numerics. I don't think I have A to I or I to A. I'd have to implement it, and I really don't want to. See if it does anything. Well, the thing is that the opcode that we're seeing is push DS where it goes kaflui. 
Not that we're getting a whole lot of useful information out of 86 box, but I'll take what I can get. Oh! Now that I didn't expect. We're crashed in protected mode. We made the jump to protected mode and we're in 32-bit mode. So how far down this do we get? Like if I go right here to when we try to jump to the 32 pit, um, I didn't think we were getting that far. It means that we actually made it into protected mode. Chat, the plot is thickening. Now, I have this theory that I, I, at least, I'm wondering if it's going to crash here. I'm sorry that I've run out of conversation, but I'm... It actually gets all the way right to this jump statement and then goes kaboom. So what the heck is an EAX? Jump to the 32-bit entry point. But is the 32-bit entry point here, or is it elsewhere? No, I took out the other loop. Uh, we can confirm. I just took that out, so if I have another loop, let's make sure. So the question is, where does it go from here? Because it should be getting that entry point from the bootloader. And Loadland's code hasn't changed. Wait a moment, hold on. So interestingly, look, it is actually having an instruction fault. Wait, wait, I want to check something. Hold on. Uh, can I tail F this? I don't, yeah, I don't think that works. Hold on. I want to check something. Are we faulting... We might be getting farther than we're supposed to on bad data. We might have being have bad data coming in. I want to see if it does the Well, I've tried it with SysLinux and I've tried LoadLin, but uh 
I've never heard of Lin LD for Linux. And Google isn't helping me. Is on GitHub? The problem is I don't have an easy way to know what's an EA hex. I'd have to get more of a debugger out. And uh, that didn't print out anything. Okay. I would have... Ex okay, so it can't... Alright, I guess it can't monitor files like that. Damn it. Uh, Alright, so we know that there's no loop here. So where does it end up after the protected mode jump. Because EAX should be coming from the bootloader. Setting up an LDT, uh, hold on, is LDR over, does LDR override a return any value? Just confirming. Flags affected, no. Protected mode instructions, no. Uh, no, I don't think LDT changes. Yeah, I can't imagine load local descriptor. Unless it's loading in set the TR uh, the task register to make Intel VT happy. For 2K sets up its own stack. Valid stack to debug hacks and we'll use it. Um, I am I'm kind of reaching my mental limit right now. How many hours have I been streaming for? I've been live for seven hours. Well, the kernel fits on a floppy disk. So EAX is the argument that's passed. Yeah, it should be the first argument that gets passed. Because we, we jump into assembly code with protected mode jump out of here, out of PM which is right here. Uh, and so we pass in the code 32 start from the header. Like, if we go to header.h, that should be over here. Wait a minute. Uh, default for big kernel. What is big kernel? Let me just see what this used to look like, because um, in this case, knowing what it used to look like might give me a better idea of what it's supposed to look like. Uh, IA30, nope, that ain't it. x86, I'm in boot, header.h. Setup start word. Here loaders can put a different start address. OX big kernel. This feels part of this doesn't look right to me, but I also don't know enough to Save for CERN. I'm currently, I'm just looking at what the, how this code looked at in kernel 2.6. It doesn't look particularly different. Yeah, 
Yeah, all that code is completely di uh, completely the same. All right, let me see your Boot dot H. Command line find option and accessible. Yeah, I'm. The crash only happens on, um, it, it, it works on Pentium 2, it works in Qume, it works in Botch. It's only when I'm on a 4, actual, a 4A6 or a Pentium, it goes kaboom. As to why it's going kaboom is a very interesting question that I can't answer right now. Because I'm not sure where the other half of uh, entry 32. I feel like that would be entry 32 on. Or not entry 32. What What's it called? Or right, hold on. It, we still got to be in this same file. So. A20. Main header. So once we get out of compressed, we should end up here. Is it possible we're heading into? No, I don't think we can be heading into the code sixty four. Uh, so startup 32, let me see where this gets, because you're going to have to make um, a jump from this. So if we're in boot compressed, because we still have to be in the compressed code startup. Hold on. Let's look at how the kernel is actually laid out in memory because this is going to be important. Um, so entry is entry 32 for the VZ, VM Linux. Uh, parts of head 64 assume start 32 is at section there. Uh, So we have header here, boot header.s, startup32. Startup extract has to be bigger than the TO. Heads of the ZO, uh, what is ZO? Provably in safe compression is hard, worst case scenario. Uh, so this handles all the decompression. Length of the kernel command line was added boot protocol 2.06. So wait, it does work with Pentium Overdrive.
I'm just just so I'm not losing my mind. Is there any C moves being used here? Oh, wait, 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 wait. Include ASM bit ops. Nope, that's only used on 64 bit. Okay, so that's irrelevant. Uh. Boot CPR uh, CPU string. What's this used for? Capacity strings? Oh, that's probably all CPU ID. Okay. Uh, is there anything else here we care about? CPU, like, this is all later in the startup process. I think we're just jumping into the wrong... Code 32 in Lowland starts physical, config physical star. All right, so config physical start. That looks like that has an extra zero, doesn't it? Okay. All right. So this is this is what it's set to in dot config. Uh, let me grab the source code to load Lin. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold the boat, hold the boat, hold the boat. Uh, I gotta tear this tab off. I think I found it. I think I found the problem. Code start 32, here loaders can put in start address for 32 code, 0x100 for default Z image. Uh, Yeah, did there's an extra zero there. Hold on. Did this change? Found in Linux kernels three dot two and later. It doesn't explain syslinux, but that could be a separate bug. Well, 
Well, config M4A6 is set. Big kernel means it's compressed. Hold the phone. Something says either I am going completely, completely crazy here, which is not unheard of. XA6. I have that feeling I'm I'm looking at the wrong thing. Like I, I feel like Uh, it says if kernel is relocatable, it should be. Is it possible I don't have a relocatable kernel? I don't have a relocatable kernel. Hold on. Hold the boat. Hold. Kernel relocatable was added in 5.8 and later. Oh no, but it's also available later. 10% uh, larger, but are discarded at runtime. If relocatable, why the kernel uh, runs the address is at and the compile time physical address is used at the minimum location. That may be what broke it. Also, let me just make sure CMove isn't defined. Yeah, it's not. Physical line is set. Physical start. You know what? Just, just because I'm curious. Making the kernel 10% bigger probably means it won't fit on a floppy anymore, but you know what? We can live with that. Um, I want to, let, I'm going to test, it. let's test this. Let me first test for using a lower physical start. Because the value in, Lyle, in Loadlin and this does not match. Or if it does match, then I'm overly tired. But let's just... Just for the sake of ruling it out. Uh, the chat overlay doesn't... Uh, I gotta fix the scenes. The chat overlay uh, should be there, but... Um. Yeah, I got I got to fix the scenes. It doesn't show up when I'm in desktop view for reasons. I mean, how often is someone going to be trying to build a minimum kernel size re uh, config relocator? I could do the same trick, but I don't think it would buy me enough disk space here. Um, also, like I said, I want to, let's see what this does. I don't remember if I removed my loops or not, but we'll find out. Or 
We're about to find out if this does anything. Uh, well, it crashed. I, I really shouldn't be surprised. Did we get anything different in the 86 box lab? Anyway, chat gave me commands. Yeah, get contacts. For that. Let's look at the log. Uh, yeah, nothing different there. Okay. Let's try making the kernel relocatable. That's kind of my last idea here. Uh, I'll take the RAM disk off the drive just because I probably don't have enough disk space. Well, we can try. We'll see if it fits. Unfortunately, the code to do that is uh, no longer in the kernel to be able to swap disks like that. So let's see if that does anything. Yeah, no, I could load this from a hard drive. It's just seeing if we can even get it, but I can't even get the modern kernel to start on a four, granted, on an emulated 486. I probably should rename the stream because this was like a whole lot more debugging than actual trying to make it work. Because I am definitely getting a little, I'm definitely more than a little stumped. I should try the Lin LD thing though. Am I streaming for seven hours? <laughs> well, at least understanding it. Yep, disc fall. That 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 went about as well as I thought it was going to go. Uh, you know what? That's fine. Yeah, you know what? That's actually fine. Because what I'll just do is if if it can successfully start, I don't I, I'll deal with the RAM disk later. Because that at least tells me the basis of what's going on. So I guess all I really need to do is load lin b bz image, and let's just see what happens. Oh, yeah, you can't see. I'm sorry. You haven't missed anything. It's just load lining. I still can't find that Lin LD tool that someone keeps mentioning. Yeah, and that just. Yeah, okay. I'm a little inclined to toss it in right now because I am legitimately running out of ideas. Uh, yeah, it keeps triple faulting. We know I, I was I've been debugging it for the last few hours. We know exactly where it's triple faulting. It where is it? We actually get right here to right before it jumps to protected mode. So I think the value it's getting for EAX is completely bogus, but that should be coming from load lin or the bootloader. But on both for uh, both on syslinux and on load lin, it goes up in flames on an actual 486. 
So 412 works. All right, I'll try 412. Like, let's try and actually, if a 412 kernel works, then I can bisect it, and then I can figure out what actually broke it. All right, so let me make clean. Because if 512 works, then I'll just bisect it. I... All right, chat, while this builds, I'm going to go take a five minute break. So I'm going to turn off the face cam. I'm going to stretch my legs because I've been sitting at this desk for seven and a half hours. We'll take another step. I'm going to make one more stab at it and then we'll see. So you can watch the build progress while it goes.
I'm back. Yeah, I didn't get that far. Oh well. Just hold the enter key down. I am tired. If this works, then we'll probably have to do a bisect section. I don't a bisection to figure out what commit actually broke it. Yeah, no, I'm back. I I forgot that I was gonna ask config questions, or I went I would have let it go a little longer. I just I made the I'm starting to make the habit of when I need to take a break from something to actually go downstairs and get a little bit of fresh air, because I have this really bad tendency that I will not leave my apartment for days. I am a borderline recluse at times, despite how much I used to travel. Okay, so disc full. Yeah, that's fine. I, I just don't care. Uh... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Control-C to Control-C. I have to eject and put the disc back in. NT Alpha is making progress. It now gets into the installer these days, so it is starting up. It, it tries to start NT. Well, I don't know if it's actually getting into NT kernel, but it gets a lot farther because there's been active interest in it as of late. I don't know, you know, partially because the APX64 builds of Windows have surfaced. Okay, so that that did not work. Let's try starting from Syslinux. Like, let's let's see if Syslinux is still broken. Uh, not network. So that loads Syslinux. Oh, it's it may fail here because there's no RAM disk. I don't think it's compiler linker assembler issue. We can start on Pentium Pro. And the opcode error we get doesn't seem to suggest that this is a pen. Um, this doesn't seem to suggest that it's that kind of problem, but who knows? Well, Pentium Pro has a lot of does, adds quite a few low-level opcodes. Invalid argument. Okay, so Syslinux has no change in behavior on the 2.15 kernel. Oh wait, maybe it doesn't have enough disk space. Hold on, I. How do I build the disk image? Maybe it's not. No, I write the floppy out from scratch. Is the bzip Linux file too big? No, that should fit. I do have a real 486 lying around, I just don't have it hooked up.
No, we're trying to use modern kernels, that's the problem. So 112 doesn't load. Let me look, hold on. Linux 46 5.1, like what was the version that they got working? Because I, I read an article, Linux Hackaday 46. Which version of Linux is this? It's a two. It's a 2.6 kernel that Hackaday reports working. So let's try a 2.6 kernel. Because at this point, I want. I would like to end at least with something working. But uh, whew, I am. We. I am definitely reaching the limit. Alright, 2.6 won't just work. I need to give it the full strength, don't I? Uh, what is it? What was the last 2.6 version? Kernel.org. Uh, you know what? We could try long term 2 for the. We'll try one of the long-term servicing branches. 2454. Because the Hackaday Post reports that 26 can boot successfully. Uh what failed? I probably have to do make clean. Uh, source. Yeah, let me just do make clean. All right, I think this is gonna be my last attempt because at this point, my brain is completely mush. Well, I've been looking for Lin LD, but I can't find it. Did I not change the year? No, I did. Five point. Yeah, I just did do a clean. Let's see here. Lin LD GitHub. And yeah, I still can't find that. So it's building all that. It's building BusyBox. Actually, I should get rid of that. I thought that didn't work anymore. Like it has that hasn't worked in many years where you could just write an image file to a floppy disk and have it start, but I could be wrong. So that built. So the question is, will it run?
I think the boot sector code lasted until the three X kernel series, but I'm not certain. It it was there for a long time. Oh, sorry about the webcam. We were just rebuilding it. It's not really blocking anything. Argument failed. Okay, so SysLinux is still having problems with this. I will try LoadLin, but I am not optimistic. Uh, we're trying to figure out what it takes to get Linux running on a 486, apparently. I'm using Windows 11 because Ubuntu as a daily driver has been pain and suffering for many years, and the most recent release was enough to uh, basically just make me give up trying to use Linux as a daily driver. I am definitely, definitely falling asleep here. Yeah, I think this is where I'm going to call it because I don't think I have any more energy. Yes, indeed. I, I talked about at the very beginning of the stream about the SCOTUS, real, SCOTUS basically um, gutting LGBT protections. Ah. <sighs> It's almost, it's almost like they don't, you know, it, it makes it very clear how much, yeah, okay, I think at this point I am calling this. I'm going to rename the stream as to debugging Linux on a 4A6, and um, maybe someone else will have an idea because I am stumped at this point. Because this builds, I might have to try some of the other uh, floppy Linux or see if anyone else can have any good ideas. That's a little depressing because obviously I would love to have Linux working on a floppy disk, but oh well. And as a reminder, Reminder, the ability to be yourself is a human right, and trans rights are human rights. I'm not going to private this stream. I, I'm i running on absolute fumes. I'm going to rename it just because what we are doing uh, and what I intended to do turned out to be two very different things, but it was fun. I will spend some a little bit more time working on it, but... I don't know where to go next because I can't seem to get any Linux kernel running on the 4A6. Uh, on an actual 4A6. Well, we can't load Lin, we can't sys Linux. I'm not convinced Lilo is going to work. We just get that invalid argument. I mean, Linux 6.x should work on a 4A6, but obviously it's not. Yeah, I mean, they're not always going to be success stories, and I'm a little bit put out by that, because it's hard to even do a video on something that isn't a success story. I think the next stream I'm going to do is going to be something not tech-related, because I might just go completely mad otherwise. Um... I am just thinking right now what else let me hold on before we completely shut it down before we completely shut it down there was that floppy enux the single floppy linux uh thing it's from two years ago what version of the linux kernel was this using
cloning the repo, like, what version of Linux was this using? Because it's using the same tool chain that I am. So git clone Linux DIR. It just pulls the tip of the Linux um, repo. So I'm not even convinced that this would build anymore. I'd have to try it and see if it does or doesn't. You know, a part two may be a good idea. I just, I would need to have a better debugging setup before I dig into it, and I'd have to think about it. Uh, or not that I'd have to think about it, I'd have to really try. So this kernel, okay, so the kernel that the Flop Enix. You know, hold on. Yeah, so this is not using relocatable. You know, just for the sake of trying. Just for the sake of trying, I'm going to grab this config. And I'm going to try building that version of the Linux kernel. So the version of the kernel that was built here five thirteen RC five. So five let's just try five thirteen zero. Excuse me. Because this is a known good config. Alright, that that's not gonna work. I just want to, I would like to end with a success. 5, 13, 19 was the last point release. Like, let's, let's try one more, because sometimes you get lucky. It seems to work on some 486s, not, but not others. I mean, this could just be an 86 box bug, which wouldn't surprise me. Uh, so, but let's just, let's find out. Like, let's actually just find out. Because at this point, my brain is completely mush. And if this works with a different config, then I've been doing something wrong this entire time. It could be an emulator issue, but I would have to... Yeah, we can just do these plugins, like whatever. It could be a toolchain issue. It could be one of so many things that I'm not even sure where to start looking. I've tried it with a few at this point. We can get it to start with a Pentium Pro configuration. We can get it to start... But it doesn't start with 4A6. Mega, is that real hardware or not? Uh, or is it emulated? Okay, so that all works. Uh, all right, so 86 box, put the floppy image in. Well, I'm not convinced that there isn't a sys Linux bug here as well. I figured it was going to happen. <sighs> Alright, I think at this point I'm going to call it.
folks. It wasn't exactly a success, but I had fun with it. We've been streaming for eight hours. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm just catching up with chat. Uh, this is your host, and Commander, signing out, wishing you all a pleasant day. And try and stay positive. I know there's a lot in the world that is not great. And if you watch the beginning of the VOD, I talk about that a fair bit at length. But, yeah. All right.